All right, people. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon the time that you are catching this. Y'all already know who I am. Dr. Julio, otherwise known as Austin Julio Brown. And remember, mine is just a nickname, folks, relax. But I am joined by two PhDs this evening, two educated black women. And we're going to talk about something that they know a whole lot on, psychology, specifically the psychology of the black community. Now, everybody has been messaging me, going back and forth about one of the videos that I posted a long time ago that has gotten now 490,000 views. And it was about modern black men acting as if and acting like baby boys. Now, I'm going to play the video and we're going to discuss it. And that's where we're going to that's where we're going to take the conversation. And before I play the video, I want to give people just a little bit of backstory. If you've ever actually watched any of John Singleton's films, if you've watched Boys in the Hood, if you've watched Baby Boy, they are trying to give you messages. They're not pieces that are cult classics, in my opinion, for the right reason. And I'm going to express that and explain what I'm talking about in just a minute. I'm going to share my screen with everybody so that way y'all can watch what I'm talking about. This, I ain't even take the time to put the jacket on because the hell with it. The modern black man is a baby boy. The modern black man is a baby boy. This don't apply to all of us, but this applies to a large percentage. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play something that I that everybody's heard before. Everybody's heard what, I'm, what you're about to hear. But I want you to take a new set of lenses and, and observe and, and really... He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the truth say unto the church. A lady named Dr. Frances Cress Wilson. She has a theory about the black man in America. She says that because of the system of racism, the black man in this country has been made to think of himself as a baby, a not yet fully formed being who has not realized his full potential. To support her claim, she offers the following. First off, what does a black man call his woman? Mama. Secondly, what does a black man call his closest acquaintances? His boys. And finally, what does a black man call his place of residence? The crib. He wasn't joking with that. Now, watching that, when you watch that movie, first of all, I'm sure everybody on the panel has seen Baby Boy. I'm sure everybody has seen it. Looking at that and now in context, what do you all what do you all make of that? Dr. James, I'm gonna start with you. I'm gonna start with you first. What when you as a as a psychologist, as someone that is that has uh, the highest reach that attain the highest level of education in, in such a field when you read or so when you hear something like that and then you actually watch the film baby boy what was your take on it when you first saw the film and kind of guide us through what you just made of it in general in a general sense yeah so just to give a little bit of context i'm a community psychologist so a lot of the work that i do is specifically focused on kind of societal structure and how our individual lives are affected by what is going on in society, more specifically kind of like our mental health um, and our perceptions of ourselves and our perceptions of others. So I am not a clinical psychologist. That is not the route that I chose to go. But I do have kind of an understanding of how the world works and then how that affects people individually. So I do not like the movie Baby Boy. I am just going to be completely honest. I think the trope of some of the African-American films that exist in the diaspora are very kind of narrow lensed. Um, and so I think Baby Boy is one of those shows that kind of, to me, amplifies unhealthy things. And then people outside of our community start to watch movies like that. And they think that black people are a monolith. Like, oh, we start to think about like things like, oh, ghetto culture is black. Oh, people laying up with multiple women is black culture. Oh, people living in poverty is black culture. Because as someone who has been in spaces where I have been the only black person, a lot of these movies are the only perception 
or kind of like the entry point that other cultures have of Blackness, right? They're not going to watch something like a school days. They're not going to watch documentaries about Black culture, but they'll watch something on BET, right? And so I think it's the understanding of like, how are these narratives harmful in many ways, especially to cultures outside of our own? And then also, how do we start to digest some of these tropes and narratives as the norm? And then being if you're a Black person who is like, I actually exist outside of that, then what does that mean for like you in a community of blackness if you choose not to ascribe to those certain type of narratives? So I think Baby Boy has some points of like how black culture exists and some things that we need to be wary of, especially when it comes to kind of black men in society, black women and how we function with one another. But I think that there are so many other films that exist with black faces that we don't necessarily talk about, but everybody knows Baby Boy, right? And so I think just in that regard, like, what does that do for Black culture, especially young Black kids who are watching movies like this on BET? And what does that do to, like, their perception of not only themselves, but their community? Well, and I guess that would be, that's that's the problem. It, couldn't we argue that we, there are so many instances where people say art imitates life, vice versa. It would seem to me that the things that are the most popular within the black community are they happen to be for some reason the things that promote the the worst type of behavior. And I guess the question that I would raise, and, and that's what I want everybody to think about on the panel as we discuss this, is why is that? So I'm gonna turn it over to uh Shannon, Dr. Shannon Moore. What Shannon, what when you from your perspective, when you hear this and you you soak this in from your position, coming from the edu from the educational leadership side, what do you what do you make of it? And what have you noticed in regards to that? type of film having an impact on culture today. So um, thank you, Austin, and good evening, everybody. So yes, I am an, um, an edu educator. I taught for 18 years, and I've been in educational leadership for about the last five. So from my perspective, um, I definitely want to agree with Dr. James in the fact that Black people are indeed not a monolith. So I, I try to be very careful not to generalize. However, um, from my perspective and my experiences, I um, definitely do agree that some, I'm not going to say all, but some black men are baby boys. And from what I have seen, that is absolutely our fault. And when I say our, I'm speaking of a black, from black mother's perspectives, because the reason why today's men are the way that they are, some of them are the way that they are, is because of how we raise them. And of course, um, you know, historically, there are a lot of factors that, that is based upon going, we could literally go all the way back to slavery based on how black women chose um, out of fear a lot of times how to raise um, you know, our men. But keeping it more modern, a lot of mothers are raising their sons in a single household, which is of course at the detriment of the black community. But because they're being raised in a single household, a lot of them are being, um, like you said, they're the, they're being put in a position to be the man of the family, quote unquote. Right. They're not given the opportunity to um, be raised as strong young men. And when you raise a boy like that, you have to deal with the consequences later on, which is what we're seeing right now. Um, so a lot of them are not equipped with the skills that they need to be strong men to be leaders of households and such because they we just we didn't raise them that way unfortunately well i guess that's that's always the issue it's like we we know what the problem is but now the question that i would raise is what created that initial problem because there where every other familial structure that we're able to examine in the united states you look at asian americans indian americans caucasian americans they have had consistently a much stronger familial unit now obviously you brought up something that was interesting which is obviously the slavery uh issue mm -hmm. we suffered slavery in this country for 200 years prior to getting emancipated from six from the 1600s to 1863 when we were set uh set free with the emancipation proclamation i use that loosely what happened seriously that caused black men to once they were free from physical slavery to then still psychologically abandon their wives and children because if you examine black culture in the united states from 1940 through 1965 what we see is a massive exodus of black men leaving the home while birth rates were actually increasing mm -hmm. but familial separation was increasing at exactly the same rate and i guess that's the, that's the question that i want to have answered in this in this instance um, so I'll chime in on that. So I do think that we as Black people in America, I will only speak on an American context, because I think the 
blackness exists differently outside of America. But I do think that we as a culture are one of the only cultures that oppression looks different ways for everyone. I think when we think of like everyone always talks about slavery as like a physical form of oppression, right? But I think black people strategically have been economically oppressed, they've been psychologically oppressed, they've been spiritually oppressed, like all of all of the different ways that we view or like all of the different canons that we exist in have historically been attacked in many ways. And so I think even when we think about kind of like the household structure, if we look throughout Black history in America, we see policies, we see incarceration, we see drugs, we see all of these things being introduced into the African-American community that strategically and unfortunately have affected the familial structure because they specifically have affected men, right? And so when we're getting thousands of Black men being incarcerated and they're leaving behind women, you know what is happening to our community, right? So I think that there's this historical understanding that we have to have when we think about the Black community. But I think a big part that we don't necessarily talk about in this millennium is the piece of accountability. And I think that that is missing a lot in the Black community. As a young mom of a son, right, when I think about the way that he and me and his father have chosen to raise him, a lot of the choices that we've had to make, we've had to make, take accountability for them. If we choose to introduce these certain things to our son, like these will be the consequences long term. If we don't introduce these things, these will be the consequences long term. And I think now we are in a society where accountability is not the fun thing to, to have. Everyone is looking in many ways. And I think this is specifically in the Black community to point fingers at someone else or, oh, my parents didn't do this. My grandparents didn't do this. At some point in time, like in the now, you have to accept accountability for the choices that you're making when it comes to your sons, your brothers, your uncles, like who is holding them accountable? If society is rigged for us all to fail, right, I think it is very important for our intermost circles to hold us accountable. But I don't think that that's like the cool thing to do. I think that there are so many like podcasts and all of these things that like are pitting folks against one another. But I don't necessarily think that there are spaces where folks are coming together and saying like, how do we hold black women accountable? How do we hold black men accountable? How do we hold black parents accountable? Black grandparents, because that is not the hot topic, right? And so I think if we started taking accountability for a lot of the things that we're seeing, we would start to see the Black family to shift in a more healthy way, but I don't necessarily know if we're there. Nicole, I want to throw it, I want to throw it to you to uh, continue what Dr. James is, is talking about. When you look at the Black familiar structure as someone that is a femininity mentor that, that helps women get married, how much of an impact does this type of does that type of material that we just heard from Baby Boy or films like Boys in the Hood? How much of an impact does that have on young women, and how much of a dichotomy has that created from your experience with 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 adults in the black community that are seeking to get married and and, and stuff of that nature that are still trying to maintain that traditional family unit, if you will, or is traditionalism dead at this point in the, in our in our community from your perspective? Oh, wow. That's a loaded question. So, yeah, this in the night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're making me work hard tonight. So, yeah, the, the movie is important because it documents where we are in our community, as ugly as it may seem. Entertainment um, imitates life. And that's unfortunate for a lot of people because they don't want to see what's reality a lot of times. And we go to being entertained, not educated or not reminded of reality. We want to um, kind of separate from reality for an hour or two. And we don't want to see reality, uh, unfortunately. But that's what it is. And for a lot of women, this is their reality. <laughs> this is who they're around. These are the type of men that are in their proximity. So when I start talking about being feminine, they see that as weakness because they are having to, out of survival, having to switch into a position where they have to provide and protect for themselves. And they've seen this for generations of women in their families. So when I talk about marriage, that's not an immediate reality. What's immediate is that I need food, I need shelter, I need to be able to pay these bills, I need to be able to handle my immediate uh, problems, and I don't see where Black men is going to fit in there and make that happen for me. 
So can you show me how to make some money? That's a lot of black women's reality. And that's just where we are. So um, what I try to do is try to reset and offer another alternative to people who may not have had known about uh, the traditional structure. And I have said many times that it will not be widespread amongst black people because we're too far down the rabbit hole, unfortunately. So there will be people who will embrace it and they'll give it the old college try and they'll be successful. And then there are some families who will try it and that might not work for them. A two income structure family may work best. And then some women are just going to stay single and some men will stay single. That's just where black people are today. But for those women that um, are open to that structure and the men that are open to that structure, there is an undercurrent going on in America where we're kind of swinging back right a little bit when it comes to values. And so that's where a lot of women are now starting to say, hey, wait, you mean I can actually stay at home with my own children as opposed to going to work? And I don't have to be ridiculed about it. I don't have to feel guilty about it. Or I still have value um, at home. Um, and, and you're starting to see a wave of black women look at the world uh, just a tad bit differently um, because that never was presented to them as an option. College was presented to them and that's it. If that was presented, it was work and and figure it out. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think traditionalism is dead 100 percent for blacks. I do think. My professional opinion is it's it's over for the majority, and but the few of us, <laughs> the few of us that that embrace it, great. But I don't, you know, I don't, you know, um, ridicule people who don't embrace it. That's their absolute choice. And then some people, the majority of Black people, in order for us to kind of get out of the rabbit hole, just real succinctly um, put, is they're going to have to have two income structure families. They're going to have to be the Brady Bunch. He bring his kids. You bring your kids because that's a reality in the black community, too. And we're going to have to rock out as two blended, uh, uh, a blended family with two incomes. That's just what the majority of black America will end up doing. Thank you. Now, and, and <laughs> not you dropping the dropping the bomb. So for everybody, very quickly, for everybody that's on TikTok watching, watching us, we're on YouTube. If you click the link in my bio. Or, or click the uh, link to YouTube in my bio on TikTok. You can join us. Yes, this is Nicole Michelle. And we also have the pink pill with us. He has just joined in. Chrislyn, how are you? Um, so I'm going to throw it to you. And then we're going to continue the conversation. When you, you've obviously, you've obviously seen two videos of mine. You were actually the inspiration for one of them that went viral where we read your letter to single mothers. Now, because you're here, I want to ask you this directly. When you wrote that letter, what was the intention behind that? And what reaction did you garner specifically in this part of the conversation from the men that you came across that had read the letter? Because a lot of when women have read it from the women that I've spoken to after I read it on my channel, they were like, this is, you know, this, this is what this is what an issue we've been experiencing. But what was the reverse? Because we never get to hear what men thought from such a scathing letter that essentially said men hate women. And they express it through the way they treat them. Yeah. Um, so it, the way that it was interpreted, um, unfortunately, was that I was trying to tell Black women that they should not have male children, that they right. should not, you know, um, which is absurd, right? Because as a mom of four, traditionally, you don't find out the sex of your baby until you're well into the pregnancy, six months pregnant, where you get the structural ultrasound. And that's when you find out the sex of your baby. Um, I don't know many mothers who could go through six months with a child incubating inside them. And by this time they're moving around, they're doing this, and then you find out it's a boy and, you know, just get rid of it. Right. That would never be something that I would say. But what I did say was that, and the, the conditions in which, we are bringing these children who are male into the black community is causing some angst that is going to be directed to the very people that are giving birth to them. And it may not be to the mom personally, because it, it usually that anger that they feel about not having a father in the home, feeling like, why didn't my father think that 
you were good enough to marry, all of that stuff. They're, they may be thinking those things, but they're projecting them on to other women that look like you. Um, you, are the, you, you are the representative for the mother that they feel like, well, why can't you be like this? Why couldn't you have been good enough? And why are you this way? And so it just, the, the projection is directed towards all of us. And I said, listen, we have to stop. Um, we need to stop going in this direction because we're creating legions of black men who hate us. And um, it is virtually impossible, in my opinion, to do to raise a, a particularly black boy child um, without some scars, without something, some remnants of something. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. Yes, we've seen the success stories, but for the most part, the data show that the boys just aren't doing well, and they're angry, and they're directing the anger at us. So Matt, why why are we continuing? That with that point about the men not doing well, there is data that demonstrates that by the time black boys reach fourth grade, I don't have it, have, have y'all ever heard of a uh, the the documentary or the lecture series countering the conspiracy to destroy black boys by Dr. Kwanzaa Kunjufu. Have y'all ever have y'all ever watched that documentary? There's a section there. He was a he was a, uh, a PhD as well, and I believe his was in uh, psychology as well. He dealt with youth, and one of the things he was able to determine was that. When you look at how black boys are treated in school, by the time they reach fourth grade, that is the cap of their academic achievement for the mo for most black boys. And this is across the United States. He his claim was that our educational system does not treat black boys with the same type of attention as it does black women black girls. Uh, studies indicated that black women or black girls from ages from age, what is that, nine to 10 years old up through high school are given are seen to be more attentive in class, uh, more responsive to teachers, more responsive to correction, whereas black boys are not. They're typically more likely to end up in disciplinary issues. Uh, they more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. And his theory was that because black boy, because young boys and girls have different learning styles, the American educational system simply puts the female above the male from a psychological perspective with the amount of tension that they pay to them. How much of an impact do you think that has with the, the quote unquote hatred that black men display towards black women? Could it be just a cry for help in the, in a unique sense? Well, I think women, uh, girls in general do better in grade school. Like I, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's necessary. I think racial component maybe makes things a little bit more complicated. Maybe it's a little bit more pronounced, but just in general, girls do better in grade school and in school in general because we're more compliant. Um, we don't act out as much. We don't necessarily have the nervous energy that we have to, to put out there. Um, I don't know if, I, I've also heard, read some studies that black girls are punished more and harsher in school as well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the problem that I have with these arguments is that um, we're here too. You know what I mean? Like you grew up in this home with these this parent or these parents, we were here too. Like we're, we're having the same experience, but somehow um, uh, the men have it worse. I, it's, it's weird to me. Like how are the men ha having it worse if we're in the same, we have the same situation. We're we're going to the same schools. We have the same parents. We're living in the same neighborhoods. Um, you know, we're having the same experiences. Um, we have it just as bad. I just think that it it shows up in different ways. Like the the way in which we are affected by these things show up in different ways. I think that women are able to like better navigate the you know do as you're told, you know follow the line you know, walk the line to, to get your education, get your career. And we also do it out of necessity. I mean, I don't know if you guys have talked about that yet, but in the black community, education and career is our husband because who else is going to be our husband? But see, now that that's where I would raise, and I, I hate to put on my red pill hat here, and this is to all, every, all the ladies on the panel. Dr. Jordan Peterson has stated in a multiplicity of interviews, Crystal, don't laugh because you know I quote him at length. He has stated in a multiplicity of times that one of the greatest regrets that he has heard from women that are that are wealthy, that are in the top 15 uh, and 10 percent, the they regret focusing more on their career than their husbands. And that isn't it. 
the issue that I'm finding in the in when I, when we have these conversations is that people do not want to act as if we were designed for a specific purpose. We are social creatures. We are meant to be together just from a survival standpoint. How much of a detriment has the push for women to get degrees? How much has that caused to the general infrastructure of our community specifically and then our just our communities at large? Out, okay. even outside of the black community. Okay, that's a that's a you're you're gonna get a two different questions. You're gonna get two different answers from me. Mm -hmm. um, in the black community, it's an absolute necessity for a black woman to get an education and good career. Like there's just we we can't you cannot say to a black girl um, and woman to wait for the a man to come and be a provider and a husband and all of these things because the data just shows that the odds are not in your favor. Like you're going to be playing the hunger games, black love edition. And, um, it just, it, it doesn't behoove, um, parents to advise their girl children to do that. And I'm Gen X and whether through osmosis or whether my parents told me or not, there was some sense that our parents felt like there was not going to be that husband. There wasn't going to be that um, provider that we could kind of lean on. We're also not taught to go to college. We're not taught to look for husbands there. Like part of my advocacy is young college black girls be looking for your husband because we were taught, at least in my generation, we were taught you go to school, you get an education, you know, that's the, don't get pregnant. That was it. Nothing about a network building, nothing about finding a potential partner, nothing. Many of us just were not taught. And so we had to do this out of necessity. It's not that we wanted to do it. It was that we felt like we had to. And the community will punish you if you don't. Because listen, what if, a, what, if a, you know, what if a black girl says, you know, I'm just going to um, work as a secretary and look really pretty and just wait for, you know, my boss to like ask me for a day and then we're going to get married and I'm going to like be a, like that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen for us. That's not our experience. It'd be nice if it happened, but it just doesn't. Okay. Whereas greater society. So here's my second, the second part of it. The greater society, if you're talking about white women, you're talking about Asian, Asian women, Hispanic women, I think they're sort of um, enculturated in a different way up until recently in the last 25, 30 years to kind of always have that option. So they are actually rejecting the option. We don't have the option in the first place. They have the option to reject. So she's saying that I, you know, if, if there's a, you know, a, a white woman who says, I reject, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I um, regret having gone the corporate route and foregoing marriage and children and things like that. Honey, you had the choice. You had the choice. We don't. So your argument, your argument and, and, and is that they black women is, is purely survival. They, they, it's Absolutely. Purely, Shannon, Absolutely. Dr. James. So we, get into a mo we were talking about later, but we do get into that mode where we feel like we got to do it all ourselves. And it's very hard to try to integrate other people. Like once we are in that self-sufficient sort of masculine role of having to provide and everything, right. but other races of women have that choice presented to them much earlier mm -hmm. than we do. It's, it's like, it's like Cinderella. Like you might as well be reading Cinderella to me when you're talking about waiting, you know, being the secretary, waiting for your boss to, to come and marry you. That just, okay. I would love to interject on that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because I have actually made some content recently specifically about that, um, how women in our generation, and I'm um, Gen X, X Xennial, they're right there on the cusp. And we were all raised to believe that um, education is number one. That's what that's more important than anything else. Right. We got to go to school. We got to get our degrees. We got to be professional because we may or may not have that man or that husband there to right. support us. And um, so I have made content because me, myself, I have had an awakening. And it, as it turns out, um, me, hundreds of, of women have responded saying that they too wished that we had been raised differently. Um, yes, education is important. However, should it have been the most important thing? Should it have been our focus? Um, because like, like you were saying, women, other women are raised with the whole ring by spring mantra. You know, they go to college, 
their children dating yeah, around. They're going to college and for their man. No. Yeah, they go. They're, they chill for the first couple of years, but by that junior year, baby, they're locking it down. They are has been picked out. They know who who was going to be by senior year. It's it's that's a wrap. Been there, and they're raised like that. And I'm going to speak for myself and hopefully for, for some other women in my generation as well. As a woman with a 22 year old daughter, I'm raising her to, yes, your degree is important. Your education is absolutely important, but you also need to be focusing on these young men who are in college with you right now mm -hmm. and focusing on the ones that are going to make good husbands and good potential fathers. So, so we're, we're late to this game, but I'm, I'm changing it up. I'm telling you right that, now. That, now Sam, I, I'm glad you changed the game up, but mm -hmm. what? I'm gonna. I'm going to throw another curveball in this conversation because okay. that is now applying to quoting my friend Nicole Michelle down there. Marriage is becoming an elite institution among Black people. Less than one in well it, now right now statistically one in four Black women are getting married, mm -hmm. but the rate at which Black women are producing out of wedlock kids has only dropped by five percent over the past fifteen years. Mm -hmm. So and there are in fact women now saying they want to be mothers, they don't want to be wives. So what is your message to them? How do you change their philosophy and their ideology if it's at all possible? Because I'm going to say this deliberately choosing to bring a child up missing half of his genetic code is deliberately setting the child up for failure. But now we have adopted, or I would say that a lot of black women are adopting a second place mindset, it's settling for being a baby mama versus a wife in the black community. Let's be honest. You are choosing, in my opinion, to settle for second place. How do we change that mentality? In my opinion, that is the most irresponsible choice any woman, but specifically a black woman can make is to choose to be an out of wedlock mother. Yeah. We have to take some accountability. We have to do better. But see, that's that that's that you bring that, and I'm gonna be honest, you bring that word up accountability in a group of in a group of women, are not unlike mm -hmm. yourselves. You're going to say, no, it's the man's fault, which y'all know my content addresses men. I address men constantly. At what point does it become necessary for women to look themselves in the mirror as a collective and say, yes, we're not a monolith, but there's a lot of proverbial shit that needs to be fixed or no, does we have to make better choices as black women in the year it, it is 2024 there is no reason that anybody should be getting pregnant there's too many things to keep you from getting pregnant first of all accidental mm -hmm. pregnancies in 2024 what are we doing we mm -hmm. have to be responsible why are we allowing men to impregnate us before they've even considered us being a familial unit before you've made me your wife before you've committed to me and our life together. We're going to bring a child into this world? Like, what are we doing? Can I jump in here real and quick I on will, the college I point? Add, I will add something to that. So I, before I was a psychologist, I was an educator. And what I will mm -hmm. say, and I specifically taught high school students, mm -hmm. I will say that I think that the culture of the Black family is that we harp on certain things and we don't really have real conversations with our children. A lot of the pregnancies that I saw with my high school students is that they don't even know how what sex is. Sex education mm -hmm. in Chicago is not a thing. They are not taught the, the parts of their bodies. The boys are not taught the parts of their bodies. So when I think when we're talking about pregnancy specifically, knowing that a lot of the pregnancies that are happening are happening in young women. Right. We're talking about young women, teenage women, women in their early 20s. I think that even when I think about my own familial structure, I have so many conversations about school, <laughs> making sure that I'm not talking back to my teachers and all of these different things. Right. They taught me how to use a pad, but that was pretty much like how much sex ed went. There was never a conversation about like being sexually responsible, making correct choices, being worth the wait. Like a lot of these conversations are just not deeply ha being had in our culture. And so I think that the reason that people I'm not saying that there isn't a level of accountability that should be had. But I am saying that if we do want to disrupt the narrative of consistently being a baby mama, one, we have to talk about predatory culture in the black community, because I know a lot of teenage young girls who are pregnant by grown men. And then two, we have to have a conversation about like, do I even understand what my vagina is? 
there are men that I know that are in their 30s and they don't even understand how a vagina works. So imagine me being a teenager and I'm hearing all of these wives tales about, oh, you can't get pregnant if you have sex in water. <laughs> if I, I was, some of my students are like, if I have sex in the shower, doesn't water stop? Like, no, baby. And who taught you that? And then you I ain't, never, I, ain't lie. I ain't never heard the like that. Then I tell I you the stories I've heard. The stories I've heard, heard from teenagers. Look, when I tell you, they are not, and you meet their parents, and their parents are also young women who had children when they were teenagers who are doing the best that they can to try to pass those things down to their children. But they're also misinformed, right? So if my mom tells me, that somebody told her that this is how to not have a baby. And then she ended up with five kids and I do it as an 18 year old. I'm going to end up with a baby. Right. And we, we are not open to having those conversations. And like you said, we have so many conversations of like, go to school. This is what you do. This is how you make sure you don't get in trouble as a woman, but we're not, I don't think that we have a breadth of knowledge when it comes to our bodies and how they work. For us to even be able to hold people accountable there. When I have conversations with some of my students, parents, they're like 30. And I'm like, ma'am, that is scientifically incorrect. If you tell your 18 year old daughter that she's going to come home with the child, but they don't even have someone in their life to tell them those things. So it's like we have to I think knowledge really is power. Giving our community the knowledge to understand that there's another life outside of just going to school and getting degrees. And I'm a black woman with degrees. And if I could turn back the hand of time, I would be at home learning how to make bread from scratch <laughs> with my husband, with my little apron on, living a soft life. You know right. what I'm saying? But when I talk to my students, I'm like, y'all know you don't have to go to college. You can fall in love and like choose to be a stay at home mom. You right. can travel the world as a young black woman and choose to be single. Like there is more than just this one narrative of black women and black men. And I just think that our culture does not. We are so focused on this one type of blackness that we don't expose young folks to all the different types of black people you can be. You don't have to play basketball. You don't have to like there are so many like chapters but of that, black men. That then brings up a that brings up an interesting point. And, and I want to throw that, I want to throw this to Nicole Michelle. I have said that black culture is inherently toxic by nature. We have a naturalistically toxic culture. And that's something that Nicole has talked about at length. Nicole, I know you wanted to jump in when you I'm gonna phrase this question to you. When you look at the way that we glamorize and glorify only entertainment. How much of an impact do you think that possesses? And what have you what have you noticed, Nicole, from the from your perspective about how men and women value each other in today's society, especially in particular with my generation? Uh, yeah, she actually hit the nail on the head. We are conditioned to think singing and dancing and performing and yeah. playing a, a basketball or some type of athletics. We're not pushed to think um, math and science. And the world is becoming more tech as we move on. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this world is changing fast. And we're talking about singing and dancing. And my husband and I was talking about how the music industry itself is changing and how AI is going to put a lot of these record companies. They're going to have to recalibrate how they distribute music. Will we even need record companies anymore? <laughs> because folks are just downloading music from home now. I mean, so um, we, we're going to have to shift how we think and how we show up in the world and how we contribute and how we can actually stay viable and competitive on a global stage. And, and I really want to double back to Crystal and Karen's point where she was talking about um, boys in school. Um, I was reading a book by Dr. Warren Farrell some time ago, and forgive me, I don't remember which was book the, it was. Was it the boy crisis? It might have been where he was talking about boys in school and yeah. how it was a really good point that I never really thought about. But boys are more active. They want to play with blocks. They want to jump off of things. Girls can sit for hours. Little boys need to run. They need to jump. They need to build things. Mm -hmm. And our curriculum in school, I don't know about you all, but when I was in school, we all had to sit still. <laughs> and then we encourage, we expect men to just automatically go out and experience and expect to be builders 
and active and, and building things. That's how we've been conditioned to think with men. And these boys are just not like, when do they play? And then I was talking the other day to someone else about the, the video games and things like that. Um, when I was young, I was couldn't wait to get outside. I couldn't wait to walk, uh, walk around the neighborhood and stuff like that. Now, it's, these kids never leave the house. Don't, aren't you excited to get your driver's license? Oh, I'll get it whenever. Huh? I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. These folks are getting Ubers. I'm like, you get in an Uber at 21? Don't you want to get in a car and drive? <laughs> and so yeah. that so boys, boys are need to be educated a little bit differently. And that's something that we as educate, well, I'm not educated, but those of the professional educators can kind of look at how we maybe our little black boys can learn a different way mm -hmm. and not label them all of these labels like that they can't learn because unfortunately that that is embedded in their psyche that they can't learn like little girls and and so they kind of give up by the end of middle school they kind of check out of school and that's why you see the disparaging numbers between black girls and black boys in college and then to dr shannon moore's point about college I love her point because I'm absolutely telling everybody that goes to school, hey, those eligible guys, this is the last time you're going to see that many eligible bachelors in one spot. Pick one, right? But then I went to my daughter's graduation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I saw all of these Black women graduating. It was a handful of Black boys. So I'm like, um, let me recalibrate that again. So we can still say that because that's still very relevant and true, but we also need to not beat them up if they can't get a husband in college because the numbers are, that's like 20 women fighting over five guys <laughs> and two of them might not even like women and three of them might, you know, one might already have a girlfriend from freshman year. So, you know, it's just, so you're really fighting over two guys. So and, and so we can't beat them up for not getting a husband in college, but that really is true. Um, and the second place that that you can get a husband is the workplace. That is the most underrated spot to get a husband. Mm -hmm. When we go into husband, we're like in beast. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. When we go to work, we're like in beast mode, which is fine. But like if I see it, oh, um, you know, if I see somebody single and he's hot and listen, are you, is he single? Let me start asking around the office. Like, what's up? Well, women need to start thinking, maybe my husband is here. And ladies, did you know that you can still be a housewife and still be educated? Because your children, you might decide to homeschool. Like we found out with the pandemic, a lot of those women ended up yeah. homeschooling and they fell in love with it. They were like emailing teachers. Hey, I can do this at home. What do I need you for? Let me homeschool. So that degree absolutely comes in handy because you're still going to be socially mobile. You still have to represent your family. It's still a representation of your dedication to education that you can pass on to your children that's absolutely so don't think that being a housewife you have to like totally rely on your husband he could pass away he could get sick you are able to go and compete for a job to help sustain your family so you can still go to college and enjoy going and pledging the sororities and traveling and stuff and travel the world and work in corporate america for a few years and then bring it back in and be a housewife because guess what the article that I read, and forgive me, I forget again, but it was about the marriage, uh, the marriage age of Americans is hovering around early 30s. It is, so yeah. people used to be getting married in their late 20s. Now it's the 30s. So ladies, don't beat yourself up because you don't want to get married at 22. <laughs> because the average American is not. I, I'm just saying don't wait until late, 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 because the later you wait, the harder it is. I'm just being real with you. It's just real hard. Um, and so um, don't beat yourself up because um, you want to experience the world. You want to go to Brussels for one summer or you want to go to Paris and cook and paint and, and find who you are. Don't beat yourself up for it, but just kind of keep in the back of your mind and kind of um, um, manage your life that down the road, I may decide to be a wife and where and a wife and mother and where would that fit in? Do I stick with careers that are flexible? Like, can I be a psychotherapist and just counsel on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and the rest be for my family? Can I be a, a, a nurse, a teacher? Like what profession can I go in that's flexible that I can have more time for family and I still get fulfillment from having a career outside but remember, of But remember, Miss Nicole, 
Mm-hmm. I heard somebody say 27, time to sell. 35 on clearance. Oh, Lord. 40, Goodwill Salvation Army. Here you go, Austin. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I, no, no, no. You Who should know. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, that's what all these red pill guys say. Yeah, and it's like, it's but you know what? Point. But you know what? Here's the thing, though. No. Here's the other point that I wanted to say really, really quick. Go ahead, go ahead, on go Dr. Ahead. Moore's point, here's the thing about why that's so dangerous to fuss at our girls about not getting a husband in college. Okay. Because I'm going to swing it back to you brothers. You all are not ready to get married in college. Y'all have women that's lie. in. That's lie. Look, y'all are not ready that's to lie. get in college. Y'all have girlfriends in this dorm, that dorm, and that school. And, and look, and then the black, look. Nicole, uh, Kevin Samuels himself said that black men don't really catch their financial rhythm till their 40s. So we, what you're telling black women is don't go to college and then you're getting on her about her degrees and then you turn around and tell her that she should be ready to get married in her 20s when you're not financially able to, so, to handle well, a wife to her 40s. Well, now here's, here's where, <laughs> in your here's, 40s. But, no, no, because see, now y'all done got me comfortable. So here's where I side with the manosphere. So, Shami, you might be getting ready to fight. <laughs> but I want to step in and say something too after you. Yeah, you know, but this is my thing. And this is not me trying to jump to men's defense. This is me saying, repeating what women have told me. They don't want to deal with a man that makes less than X or less than Y. And they are in college. These are college age women all the way up through graduate degrees. They, there is such a focus, going back to the start of this video, the psychology, there is such a focus on materialism among our women today. Now, I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent in this instance. I'm not, I'm not speaking on whether it's right or wrong, but I'm saying there is such a heavy focus on materialism that women are choosing to date. And this is one of the reasons I believe that women choose to date older men, because they're looking for men that already have it. They don't want to do what our parents did, our grandparents did, which is build together. These are women using their feminine power, which is given to them at birth, because women, as, as Kevin said, you know, Nicole, you know it well, women are given their power at birth, men are given their power on the back end. In other words, men have to earn every bit of choosing power that they get. They have to earn their way. They have to scratch and claw for selectability. Women are born with it. Is that is that not fair and valid? To under, to, maybe we have to tell women, look, you might need to start actually, yes, getting married in college. You might need to start not worrying about if he has six figures and he's 24 years old. When you yourself, you know, you can't even scrounge enough together to get a good bowl of, uh, what is it, a good, bowl, a good can of sardines when you're in college. So, I mean, it's, it's that, is that a, a fair assessment or am I off base? It's not the women that don't want to get married, though. I, how many young girls have you said, girl, you tied down to one guy at 25, 26 years old? And, and, and it's not the being tied down part. It's the he hasn't married you yet part. See, a lot of brothers will date you forever and not marry you. And I'm saying if you're going to give wife benefits and you need the ring, the date, the time, where, where are we going to church to see you all get married? Because there is no way you should invest that time because we've seen it with our grandmothers and aunties and mamas that that doesn't work out because in the end, you're stuck with a baby. You're left with all those years invested in a relationship that didn't result in anything. Mm -hmm. So now women are saying, well, do I really want marriage? Like they're backing up and saying, well, maybe I just want to kick it and have fun because why should I get married? Because he doesn't want to get married. So like if, if you're going to get on the women about marriage, then that means there need to be some men not just using marriage as a carrot to say, hey, you need to be wife material. OK, well, sir. Where are the men that say we want wives at 25 and 26 and 27 and 28? No, they say they want to live with me and extract wife benefits from me and then tell me I'm not wife material. So you can't have both sides of the argument, sir. <laughs> Which one is it? Am I wife material or not? Me argue with you on guess that one. I can't. I can't. Kristen, what did you have to say? I know you wanted to, you wanted to add in. Well, somebody in the chat said this, and this may make some people mad, but um, one person said, why is it the discussion never about black women exploring men of other races. And I know this is a black community conversation, but I'm that, sorry. That may, be, um, that may be necessary as you and I have both said on our channels respectively, yeah. Listen, because when I was in college too, there were like five black guys there and none of them were ever attached. They always had girlfriends. They had all, all the black girls. I remember this vividly in the dorms on Friday, Saturday nights were in the dorms giving themselves bad perms and braiding hair 
and um, watching movies, giggling, talking about the five boys that they liked that didn't give, give them any attention. These guys moved around. Nobody was committing to anything except for, and this laser focus, because I was there too in college for a while, I wasn't even um, looking at other races of men. Like I just, the, 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 the blinders were not, were on in terms of not really opening so myself very, up. So you, were highly, so you were very race loyal then you would say. You were yeah, very I was. I mean, and, and, and it was, it, it, it wasn't even that I, it was a conscious thing um, to be honest with you. Cause I had dated men of you know, my first boyfriend. My first real boyfriend was Mexican. So it was always kind of lingering in the back, but it always had this assumption and you, you know, kind of like when you buy a car, you see that car, you know, you, you see the car. Everywhere. So I was just, I had this laser focus on, on just the, the type of men that I assumed I was going to be with. Like, right. yes, I could date a Mexican, but was I going to marry one? Probably. I was thinking this at the time. Right. And so I had these kind of blinders on and there were this whole group of guys that could have been interested in me that were potential. I went to one of the best colleges in California and I didn't look at them. Um, they were there the whole time. And so when we're having these conversations about the unavailability of black men and the copious amounts of black women who are in college, um, I think that the commenter who said, why aren't we having these conversations about encouraging black women to date all men, mm -hmm. right? Not just the five black guys at your school. Um, why is that not an option? And it absolutely should be. It absolutely should be. It, it should, should be, be on the table. Um, mm -hmm. Even if that person isn't somebody you marry, just the practice of dating, especially in college, knowing what you want is essential. There are so many women that I have coached through the years that have gotten uh, ABC alphabet degrees, uh, you know, as long as my arm, but they're Dating maturity level is in high school because they put that off. They didn't cultivate that like a muscle. Like you have to work that also. You have to cultivate that aspect of yourself so you know what you want. And in college is the best practice for it. And here's what I wanted to say about the women who at 22 or in college are saying that they want a man who's already established. I would say, silly girl, sit down. And here's why. Because just like Nicole said, this is the time when you have access shoulder to shoulder right. where you're all on the same playing field with the future masters of the universe. These are the men who are going to be. And what your job is, is to find somebody that you can connect with um, on an intellectual, psychological, spiritual level, right. who is going to be like, that is the only time that I feel like legitimately you can date for potential. You guys are both poor. You guys are both buying $5 pizzas. Like it's, it's equal. And, and if this guy is on the path, then, you know, hang out, hang around, hang around, but you got to make sure that the guy is going to be committed to that. But that's the time where you cultivate. I'm not talking about pulling somebody up who is not on the trajectory. And I think that that's what black women have been taught in the past to do. It's, well, it's just not even what they've been taught, it's what they've been doing. I mean, they, they've, they've done no, that. We were also literally taught to do this. Like when my book Swirling came out, uh -huh. there was so much objection and swirling is about interracial relationships from a black woman's perspective. Right. There, I remember being on a radio show. It was a, it was a, it was a big one too. I can't remember the name, but a black man called in and said, well, why won't black women look to the jails? Why won't the black women look to the jails for their husband? There's plenty of, of men who want to get married in there. And I'm like, so look to the jails, look to the jails. And so, um, or, or pull, pull a person up or this, that, and the other. And, um, unfortunately the studies show that they just don't, it doesn't turn out that story, that fairy tale Ty Tyler Perry story that he keeps trying to force feed us in every single movie ever. Um, it, it usually those have, don't have good outcomes. And so this is the opportunity where you can date somebody who is on your level. You guys are both poor, but you're on a trajectory and then you can grow together. So I would say to the girls who kind of want that entitled, 
thing, like as you're missing a great opportunity of getting somebody in on the ground floor where I would, that would be the only time that I would say that you can date for potential, but you have to also know what to look for. What are you looking for? And I don't know if they're being taught that. And so that's where, you know, Nicole comes in and, you know, I, I do some coaching on that as well because we've been there, done that. We've made those mistakes and we're like, girl, don't do that. This is, this is how it, it should be done. Mm -hmm. But, um, we, we are going to have to have the serious conversation. If, if black women are in college and the black men aren't there, what are those women supposed to do? Mm -hmm. And I also think to chime in and add to that point, I do think that there we have to think about society. So I think white supremacy is deeply rooted in black culture. Like, and when we think about attainment and get and growing closer to whiteness, black men who attain, uh, who are able to obtain a certain level of success are historically not interested in black women. And so the reality is, is that as they climb the, as, as they climb the societal ranks, as they climb the, the economic ranks, the reality is that their psyche is that now that I have attained this level of status and I am closer to whiteness, I now have more of an open door of the women that I want to date. And they usually are dating non-black women. I'm not saying that they're dating white women. They're dating women who are close to the whiteness if they can't get a white woman themselves. However, you know, Jasmine, not even to be funny. Yeah. The statistics, yes. the, the statistics and the data refute your point. In fact, when you look at if you if you pull statistics among the top 10 percent of all men, race, race neutral, pull them for the top 10 percent of white males, top 10 percent of black males, top 10 percent of Asians, Hispanics, uh, the wealthier that a male is, the more race loyal he tends to stay. I didn't wise. say wealthy. I said a level of status attainment when bl when black men get to a level where they feel like they have made it that doesn't right. necessarily always mean you're the most wealthy i know some people from the hood who feel like they get to a certain level of the status that they want in their lives right and they start to feel like they are too good for black women and i think we have to understand that black women are always and have historically been taught that if we decide that we want better for ourselves, which is not what other races of women are taught, mm -hmm. that we are now up and that we are now rejecting our blackness and that we are now we are now race traitors and all of these different narratives that are attached to black women. And I think that we have to realize that those narratives are being taught to our young girls. And we are we see in the movies we want to be right or die. I men go to jail. We holding down the kids at home. We're doing this. We're doing that. Those narratives are psychologically taught in in mass. They they to, they, to black some degree young girls. They're taught to, to black degree. young girls even in school. Even in school, we have to the, we person have to the, the person who treats you the worst. The person who treats you the worst likes you the most. The person but, but who punches me, you and steals your lunch money likes you the most. Let me, and let me we have to understand that, that when those narratives are taught to our young girls, they 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 hold to those narratives as they get older. And what we start to see is that now I'm afraid that if I am in college and the, the black men don't like me and I do want to start looking at other races of men who may actually treat me well and appreciate me. Then now I'm seeing this, oh, you a sellout. Oh, you don't like black men. Like all of the, I feel like a lot of these narratives are taught to young black girls in ways that they are not taught to young black boys. And I think that's one of the major disconnects. We are socializing our black boys and our black girls, even though they are in the same community, in two opposite, polar opposite ways that have ramifications as we get older. Because like, like I tell people all the time, brain is a muscle. Right. The, the 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 things that I take into my eyes and ears are the things that my brain starts to normalize. So if my mom is at home telling me one thing, but telling my sister something else, we can be raised in the same household. We're going to have two completely different experiences, regardless of if we live next door to each other in our house. And so I think we have to start thinking about what are the narratives that we are teaching our young black children are we teaching them that as they grow older to see one another as community and to help each other thrive and to see each other as helpmates building the black community? Or what are we teaching our sons versus our daughters? And as a black daughter who has black sisters, I am telling you that every black woman that I personally know in Chicago, Illinois, has been taught 
that if you did not have to struggle for the love, the love is not worth it. We have, I rarely hear black That's women being so taught that you are worth it. Go ahead. That is more fault of that child's mother because she has a misplaced definition of love. And this goes, of course, again, this goes all the way back to slavery. But the point that I wanted to raise was, statistically speaking, when you speak of the entertainment industry, you're right. There is a very high correlation between wealth in the entertainment industry and in black males' uh, preferential treatment of white or non-black women for his, for his choice and spouse. But across race, outside of the entertainment industry, the wealthier that a male is, the more race loyal he stays in terms of a marriage partner. Now, in someone in the on the TikTok chat also said that yes, black men are marrying black women in mass. That's true at all income levels. However, most of those marriages are ending in divorce. Now, this is where I shift the conversation. And when we examine the female psychology, because I've addressed, you know, we address men on a constant basis. Women today are initiating. 90 99% of marriages are initiated by men. 82% of marriages are ended by women. So when we look at what causes the breakdown in just the familial structure, the basic household structure, kids, you know, not even necessarily for married couples that have children, because some of these don't, they end up in divorce. What is the issue there that is keeping black relationships from actually staying together past what they call the seven year itch? What what I what I think that black women, I think that black women are not given the time to really get to know themselves in order for them to choose the correct partner. I really do believe that when I think about being a young teenager, most black young teenage girls are being taught the same things. Like we said, go to college, make something of yourself. My white friends who were young black girls when I were in college, they were like, my parents taught me to come here and find out who I am, explore, study abroad, join the Peace Corps, all of these different things of really getting to know who I am so that when I go into the world as an adult, the choices that I am making are based on who I know that I now am. A lot of black women are not taught that. We're taught to go to college, attain these certain levels, attain these degrees, right? And what that self-discovery piece is missing. So if I'm meeting a man and I don't know who I am, yes, he may seem like he's a good partner to me at the moment. And as I go through that stage of self-discovery and I realize that I have grown and I have become someone different, I'm starting mm -hmm. to realize that my partner is not at the same level. We tech, we actually don't have the same things in common. We're not on the same. We don't, we don't have the same values. I think the self-discovery piece in a black community is very, very harm is, is missing. And I also think to your point about entertainment, we have to understand that young black kids are not taking their cues from anything other than the entertainment industry. So if what I'm looking at is basketball players, fault, isn't rappers, it? And X, Y, Z, then now those cues that I'm taking in, because like I said, your brain creates normality from what you see and what you hear. All if right. all I see on TV is my favorite NBA players pulling up with their non-black wives, I'm not going to go read a doc watch a documentary and read a book about all of these black people who have money and have a black wife. I'm going to look at what I see. My mind is going to create that as a normal thing. And that is the cue that I'm going to take as I grow up. So we, as in our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, we have the knowledge to go and understand that that may not be the norm. An 18-year-old boy, a 21-year-old boy, a he's not doing that. He's going to look at what's on TV, what he hears in music. If they saying dark skin, not my type, light skin is the way to go, my brain is going to take that as normal. And we have to understand that that is what is starting to create the narrative with the young people. Now, that's, our that's a good, that's an excellent, that's an excellent segue. That's an excellent segue because Shan, and first of all, we got Dr. Albert that's joined us. It's good to see you, Dr. Albert. Always a pleasure. Shan, I want to throw this back to you Hello. because your dissertation was on mm -hmm. colorism and its effects on students in the classroom. Now, Dr. Jasmine raised a hell of a point when she brought up, if it ain't light skin, it ain't right, and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In today's society, isn't it fair to say that women have weaponized the colorism battle against each other, or or is that still something that is that was perpetuated by men and women today are just dealing with the aftermath of a standard that men already put in place? Um, I do think it goes both ways. However, in the black community, Colorism affects um, everything from how we date. Um, it does affect the marriage rates of black women. My dissertation was about color colorism and education specifically um, as it pertains to students. However, in doing the research, I have found 
that colorism affects the marriage and relationship rates of black women. In what sense? Um, in the sense that a lot of black men prefer lighter skinned women. And so lighter skinned women, because of that, automatically with a lot of black men, and notice I'm not saying all, but with a lot of black men, right. lighter skinned women do automatically have an advantage and an upper hand because they tend to be put on a pedestal um, because, you know, whatever is closer to white, whether it be conscious or subconscious, a lot of times uh, black men are raised to believe that that is better for a variety of, of reasons. Okay. And who's, I guess that's the thing that I've never understood. Who the hell is putting this ideology in these kids' heads? Is it just, is it, is it, because what it keeps sounding like, this keeps going back to our consumption of media and the types of media that we consume. So now the question that I would raise is, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure I believe everybody on this panel is a parent. Why, why do we not just stop our kids from watching the bullshit? Why don't we just it's stop not the media? The media has is, is a huge proponent of colorism, but colorism is ingra deeply ingrained in black society. Um, and usually our, the first exposure to colorism is our own families. I mean, we all know uh, our older aunties and, and grandmas that as soon as a baby is born, they look at the ears and the fingernails to try to figure out what color the baby's going to be. <laughs> colorism starts in our family, in our households, way before kids are even exposed to, to, to media. So that's the first um, exposure. And then, of course, in schools, colorism is rampant from elementary school all the way up through high school and, and beyond. So it's not just the media. We can't blame that. We have to blame each other and our, our families and how we're raising our kids. Yeah, I can understand that. I can understand that. Dr. Albert, I, I do want to jump to you. Um, when you are listening to the conversation, I'm, I'm not sure how long you've had a chance to to listen to what we've had to say. What is your take on the general connectedness or dichotomy that exists between black men and black women in relationships today. In particular, we were talking about, we were just discussing how the rate at which black people or black men and women are getting married has shown a steep decline for the past 15 years, whereas the rate at which black children are being produced outside of wedlock has dropped only 6.4% percentage points or so over the past 15 years. What do you make of that from your experience and what do you think can be done to correct the issue? Well, a lot of times when, when we're talking about um, relationships, and yes, we do have a tendency to center around a lot of internalized um, racial oppression, you know, quite naturally, us being black people, we are affected by institutions of racism. That's, that's, that's absolutely obvious. But I think one right. caveat that we're not, sometimes we don't address is our um, social economic, you know, environment. Um, you know, economics uh, affect the way that we relate to one another. You know, I mean, the inception of, let's just say marriage uh, for, for the sake of this conversation, the end game of the relationship. A lot of times, you know, it started out as a financial situation, right? An economic thing, two well-to-do families would come together and they would tie the vines. And in tying the vines, that means that you create the, the, the largest possibility, and I'm using loose terms here, so forgive me, but you would create the, the greatest opportunity to, to homestead, that means you're settling in land. So the intent was to, to create economic empowerment and, and adhesion and cohesion with two families. But as time shifted and we went from the agricultural industry into the industrial industry, we started establishing what is of course called the nuclear family. Right. And now the shift is the single family home because now men and women are equally employed and gainful in society and the economics are showing that and it's starting to shift. So now it's the single family home, even together and prospering, which is now called cap relationships, where people are actually getting married and living in different states, living in different homes, because now the economic is the economic disbursement is quite different. So when you add the, the already um, prevalent um, institutionalized racism and bigotry that black people have against each other internally because of our racial oppression, then of course it's obvious and it's actually imminent that you're going to get marriage at a 50 percentile right now, which is an all time low because at 2018 marriage, believe it or not, between 2018 and 2021 was at an all time high. And then the ship, once we got to a sense of normalcy again, we found out, you know what, we just, we're not compatibly when it comes, we're not compatible when it comes to finance. And now you're looking at these all time lows. 
So I think it's 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 a myriad of things. I don't think it is as linear as we may think. I I I, I can agree with that. Dr. Jasmine, did you have something that you wanted to add or Shan or Crystalline? Y'all all look like y'all have something to say. <laughs> yeah, so I, I had a, I was waiting because I was um um I was pulling down this book is Mary. Oh, Ralph Richard Banks. And um definitely you guys should to check it out. The dynamics for um the 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 marriage rates in terms of and I, the reason what made me inspired to go look for the book on and on my shelf was because Dr. Julio, you mentioned that when black men become more economically successful, they become more pro-black. Um, but what they don't become more of is husbands. Um, whereas um, other races of men, when they reach that $100,000 threshold, that magic six figures, they are more likely to marry and black men are the only ones that don't, they become less likely to marry right. because of the dynamics of being the magical unicorn in the black community. And I, I've um, interviewed Ralph Richard Banks um, several times and he says, and I said, well, why do you, you know, why do you suppose that is? And he says, um, well, it's basically simple. Um, why close the store when business is still so good? You know, why, mm -hmm. why come in when this is so good? Like there's such a dynamic and incongruency in between sex, uh, um, uh, financially successful, educated black women and their counterparts finding that those matches are very difficult. And these men know this. And because they know this, they're moving around, they're playing around. And so um, it becomes increasingly um, uh, harder to attain and women have to make a lot more compromises in relationships with these types of men if you want to make it work because they're, they're going to constantly remind you of how many options that they have. Um, also, there's um, been, there's, there was a study on colorism as it relates to marriage. And in the black community, those who get married first, the women in the community that get married first are women who are the lightest mm -hmm. and or biracial and, mm -hmm. you know, claiming black. So they're, they may be biracial, but they claim the black identity. Those are the very first. And the darker you are, the, 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 the last in line you are to marry. Most of us, most of us black women are not light skinned. That's why it's a novelty. Right. And so this this adds so many layers onto it. So like for, for me, it's not to say that it doesn't happen, but it's I think it's very important, particularly for the women to be fully informed about what the factors are, the risks are so that you don't go in. Because I feel like a lot of times when we have these discussions about black love and black marriage is that you they, they want women to have hold on to some level of delusion. You have to don't look at the statistics. You're not a statistics. Don't pay attention to the numbers. You absolutely do need to pay attention to the numbers because um, it will reflect even in your experiences and dating experiences. You may be confused about your dating experiences. You absolutely should know what the numbers are, or you may think there's something wrong with you. But well, let me, raise, let me, let me, raise, right. let me, raise, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Nicole, you were, was that, you were trying to say something? Was Shannon, mm -hmm. that, which one of you? No. I wanted to, um, I definitely wanted to interject on that because yeah. black women are the only women, the only race of women that are expected to solely date black men. Every other race of women can date whoever they want to date. And because of that, I we have to wholeheartedly reject the narrative that we are limited to only dating black men, especially when you add on the um the further complications of colorism and other implications. We have to date and go where we are loved, period. If we want to get married, if we want to find successful, healthy relationships and build these familial structures. And I'm not saying anything against black men because that's my first preference. However, we have to think outside the box and we have to raise our daughters to think outside the box in order to increase our chances of building healthy, happy, long lasting relationships. But and often I did want to um, also address one of the things you said about marriage rates and why we thought they weren't working. Mm -hmm. And personally, I believe that a lot of black women initiate divorce because they married men who were they were not equally yoked with. And you also raise the point on um, black women 
only wanting to marry men at their socioeconomic level. Yeah. And I personally know a lot of black women who are highly successful. I mean, over six, well into six figures who have decided to marry men and settle with men who are not as financially successful. And unfortunately, uh, roughly about 80% of those have ended with divorce because because she don't respect his manhood, Shannon. Say it. Nope. Nope. That's not what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> what I was going to say is because sometimes men feel emasculated by women who make more money than them. And then they go ahead. They have to get that mask. They have to gain that masculinity back. Every single one of those marriages ended because of uh, cheating. Every single man that in those particular relationships cheated because he, he felt emasculated by a woman who was making a lot more money than him. So okay, so this is. So, so Dr. Uh, Neo, can I just jump in really quickly? Yeah, go ahead. The, go ahead. The, the, the data also reflects that that you know stay at home dads that dynamic and you know um, marrying somebody who has this. It's not really the women who. I know that are, no are, it is. I know it don't it work. The men, it's the men that feel like I should be a you know based on the, the structure of patriarchy that you know they feel like they have to exert their manhood one way or another it it causes problems in the dynamics of the marriage when um that the husband is in that more submissive kind of financially submissive role the, the okay. men who have the problem because the, women, the, problem. Marry, the women are marrying them so here, obviously you know, here's here's the issue though Chrisley. and this is this is the thing that I've never heard a woman say out loud when a man is making less money than a woman. I don't, I don't give a what nobody say. I've heard, I've seen this done. Woman is making more money than a man. And at first it's good. Everything. I talked about this with Amber Rose in my interview with her. Everything is good in that first, the first few months. But after it, all it takes is that one damn argument. It takes that one argument. And she says, that's why I don't need you. Cause I pay the bills around this mother. Or there's some masculine statement, Dr. Albert, in my line, there's some masculine statement that is made that deliberately attacks his manhood. And that is what can lead to divorce. So yes, I don't think, and this is me. So y'all feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think it's men inherently being emasculated by women until that specific type of conversation comes up because women are some of the most verbally abusive things on this earth. Men are, men are, men are more predisposed towards physical violence. Women are more predisposed towards verbal violence. That's, that the data shows that my question is, is it, isn't it better to just say, stop to quote Tyler Perry. If all he can pay is the light bill, that's fine. Shouldn't we, we should not dissuade. We should not attempt to persuade women that that shit is acceptable because it ends not 80% in that same scenario. It ends just like that. Or is that something that, that we just got to chuck up and say, well, as long as they're married, it's okay. I think that a big problem is that we harp so much on marriage that we don't really focus on the whole human being an actually good human. A lot okay. of what I notice, especially being in the realm of psychology, is that we have people who are innately traumatized from their childhoods, toe up from the flow up emotionally, mm -hmm. don't have the ability to have mature conversations and all of these things. And I think that what we sell as the like great equalizer is marriage. You could be crazy, but if you crazy and married, somehow it like evens itself out. You could your credit score could be a one hundred seven. You don't have the ability to buy a bike, but if you get married, all of a sudden, you're a great person. Like, you could beat your kids halfway to death and have them in a cage, but once you get married, DCFS won't come around. Like, there is this weird, like, and this is why I said I think one of the major issues with marriage is that at the end of the day, as somebody who is married and divorced, I got married young, had a kid young, and got divorced. What? COVID had us really to look at each other and be like, uh, what are your values actually? Like, who are you actually as a person? Can right. we have conflict and then not be World War Seven, right? And I right. think because we were young and Black, we had not been in environments where we were taught to actually grow up and be good people. We were not taught that maybe some of the trauma you experienced as a child, you should see somebody about that before you walk to the office. But that's but going maybe back to your some point, of that Jackson, debt. 
to your point, Dr. James, that that's a problem with parenting because in the black community, we hide predatory behavior from uncle, from uncle. So, and so I agree, but I, but I think like in order for us to get to a place where we start to see these marriage numbers be success, not just who is getting married. It's like, we got all these statistics as a teacher. They're like, all of your kids went to college, but only one graduated. Like I need the full picture, right? We have all of these statistics about everybody who was going to the aisle, but who is actually staying married? Whose kids are now seeing marriage as something that they want to get and receive? Who yeah. is like, we never see those statistics. It's just in 2023, 10 million people got married. What let's let's look at that same group of people and statistically tell me, and this is why I have a problem with statistics because as somebody who is good with numbers, these statistics be all over the place. People well, lying, people putting the- people using a broken calculator. Like, I think we really have to, if we as the black community really started to think about development of character, holistic what? growth of people, you start, who see, are you educationally, who are you emotionally, who are you mentally, who are you financially? Are you a good person? Person before you walk to the altar, is that person a good person? Is this but somebody you want to raise kids with? Are y'all gonna teach your kids real good values, or are we just getting married to get married? That is the pro- mental health is very important in a marriage. We as the black community do not focus enough on mental health, financial health, emotional health for us to keep telling people just go get married when you go to college. Just but get here's, married. Here's the thing. This is this is where that conversation takes a hard, sharp ass left. Because when you start talking about character, there's there's something that get that has to be brought up in that conversation about character and morality. When you start bringing in religion, and more specifically, when you start bringing in Christianity, the black the, the black race runs from it. They run from Christianity. They run to the rocks and the stones and all of that other all that other superfluous bullshit. So so my 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 point is always this: How does the black community go about the establishment of a of a monolithic code of conduct? Because there is something that other races are doing that we are not. The Jewish community, they will stick together when necessary. I'm talking about it don't matter if you if you first of all, I've never seen a poor Jewish person. I've never I've never seen one that couldn't go to their community and get something. I have never really seen in my life a white person that could not go to the white to their community and get something. But in the black community, we have historically demonstrated that we are each other's own worst enemy. And I'm sorry, but we have been out of chains for 200 damn years. How, at what point do we stop blaming the white man for our psychological trauma? And at what point do we do what you said, which is heal our damn self and then move forward and build a better tomorrow? Because to me, the thing that, that holds back both black males and females is a deliberate, conscious, willing attachment to, to, to trauma, a la Stockholm Syndrome. That's what I'm seeing. Well, you know what? If, if I may, if I may, Dr. Hill, yeah, I like what Dr. James said. And this, this is really prevalent in the black communities. It's not about all, blaming the white man, Eric, unquote. You know, one thing about social media is it oversimplifies a complex process here. Black people have adopted a way of life from the plantation. We don't have a cultural cognate. That's why you mentioned Jewish people because they have an identity of culture. They can relate to culture. We don't have an organic cultural construct. We've internalized the lives of our oppressors. We value our axiological system. Our value system is based on the politics of white folks. The way that we eat, the way that we sleep, the way that we dress, we value each other based on the bar set by white folks. Our ontology is twice given. It's an outlier. And so now we start making these preconceived notions based on the fact that we are equal in social and economic status. And we're not. We do not share the same equitable interest as everyone does in this country. And there are nuances. I agree with that. that. My question is to you, Mm -hmm. we know we don't operate the same damn way, but we act with such a high degree of damn narcissism that we it's this is we are the culture. In this community right now, Dr. Albert, no bullshit. We are the culture that says, you know what? Um, I got a $5,000 Balenciaga bag or I got a $5,000 Louis Vuitton bag and I ain't even got $500 to put in. I ain't got $500 to put in the damn thing. I got everything that looks like I got money. I have the appearance of it, but when you start investigating the bank accounts, oh, hell, we need to go fund me for, for, for Jimmy John's funeral. We need to go fund me for this. We need to go. And, and so this this deliberate consistent 
care to appear wealthy is vastly different. It, 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 we, we, we are, we are Huey in American Gangster. We too loud. We're making too much noise. We're wearing very, 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 very nice suits that are really clown suits and costumes with big signs on it that say, look at me. And the loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. And so my question is, when will that shit stop? What can be done to eliminate the psychological narcissism that exists within this community? Because if something isn't done, if we don't get on a monolith, and I guess I'm saying to the panel, if we were if we were the roundtable group that was the Lord picked us to sit at the table and say, this is the solution for the Negro. We know what the problem is. We know the, the facts. We know the data. We know the statistics. What would we say and what could we say? To everybody to say, look, if you Negroes do this and get in line within th 20 or 30 years, the black community will be back where it's supposed to be, even if it takes a generation and a half, two generations. What could we do? If anything, what is the best possible monolithic character mindset to possess? If there is one, and that's to everybody on the panel. Whoever want to jump in first, feel free. Yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll I'll agree, I'll agree, ladies, if I may, if I may, I, it, it's the culture. Dr. Leo, it's, it's the culture. We're going to have to address the issue of our displacement with our culture. We have mm -hmm. an issue with being solidarity with black, having solidarity within blackness because we have these six degrees of separation. Right. And, and we have this bigotry and classism against each other based mm -hmm. on income stratification. We tend to believe that the more income that we make, we are the privileged black person. We don't it's have a, a sense of cohesion yeah. for all of us as yeah. a black people. So we lack sympathy, empathy, and compassion for each other. And we tend to separate ourselves. And unfortunately, because of this system, the higher we are on the economic chain, the less black people are around us. That's not our fault. And we have to start looking at us from a complete, uh, uh, you know, judging each other from a complete aspect versus an individual one. A lot of us, we become individually um, successful and we tend to isolate ourselves. And media doesn't help at all. So a successful black person appears to be solvent of, of black people, but that's not true. And so it creates a lot of complexes within us, within us socially to say, you know what, maybe I'm not the best or maybe I shouldn't deal with those types of black folk. So those kind of things have to be unearthed, Dr. Julio. And it's, it's, it's a dark side of who we are. It really is because we do have complexes against one another and it always mm -hmm. starts based on social status. And Dr. Higgins, you literally took the words out of my mouth because I was going to say that um, Black American people will never be a monolith because we have too much internalized division, like you said, based on socioeconomic structure, based on class. And nobody really talks about it, but there is a lot of classism in the Black community. What does that um, look like, Dr. Shannon? All the time. Look like? And I hear, and, and forgive me for using this word, but it's the common mantra is Black people versus niggas. And I, I hate to say it, but we all know what I'm talking about. The the classism in our community. Is amen, rampant. amen. It is rampant. And because of that, we will never be a monolith. And I, I don't see it getting worse. Hey, as, as, as more and more of us are more successful, I only see that getting worse. Honestly, but, but let's okay. I'm so sorry, but I, I agree with that. Like I'm over here doing the church dance. It's like seriously. Um, <laughs> going back to Dr. James, seriously. Um, yeah. she hit it on. At first, I was triggered when she was like about marriage, but she's absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, I would say 85 percent of Black America just need to just pause and go to therapy. Don't think about a baby. Don't think about a man. Don't think about a woman. Just you ain't going to tell me go, go to therapy. therapy. <laughs> me. You don't have to broadcast it. You don't have to put it on social media. Just go. Don't think about sex. I know you're going to think about sex. But don't think about babies. Don't think about a man. Don't think about a woman. Don't think about a relationship. Don't think about marriage. Just go to therapy. Yeah. When it's time for you to be married, when it's time for you to be a mother or a father, it will happen happen just go see about self see about your mind because a lot of the self-care conversation rarely talks about the mind yeah. we talk about the body our makeup taking a bath yeah. Yeah. you know shooting some hoops getting some energy out there but get to see about mental health that is like so because you know what <laughs> when i watch and I had to pull back from watching a lot of black TV because it's so depressing. It's pain, 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 
pain, pain, trauma. You know, you know and I'm so sick shows. of seeing it. And you know what? It just means that as individuals, we're just going to have to pause and go to therapy. And those of us that feel like you can go get, go get married, go take a stab at it. But those who say, look, hey, I'm not ready to be somebody's wife and mother. Are you kidding me? I'm not ready to take on the responsibility of a wife and children. Are you kidding me? Let Give me some time to catch my breath and understand life. I had a rough upbringing. I, I, I came into the world rolling and crashing. Give me a, a second to recalibrate and recenter myself and learn who I am as a man, as a woman maybe i don't even want to be married maybe I, I want a career maybe i don't know what i want i i don't know what i believe i don't know what i like what i dislike let me find out who i am then i can decide how and going into a marriage and starting a family that way knowing who we are is like half the battle it really is half the battle and that's to me in my opinion how we um recalibrate the black community and for does that mean that a lot of people will be getting married later in life absolutely but it's better to get married at 60 and have a healthy relationship than to get married at 25 and totally wreck each other's lives <laughs> and then spend the next 20 years healing from a marriage that we got into because we were pressured or because we were horny or because we didn't want to let that person go or for whatever reason I, we, gotta I, go, we gotta let go of our attachment to toxicity yeah, and I, I just think we're we're just so used to it. Like you go to Chicago, Chicago looks like New York. New York looks like Detroit. Detroit looks like D.C. D.C. looks like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh looks like Philly. Philly looks like Atlanta. Atlanta looks like in the black community. It all looks the same. It all looks the same. <laughs> Fifth Ward looks the same as New Orleans, as Dallas. Yeah, Compton. It all looks the same. Because and and we can immediately tell the black part of a uh, part of town. And it's full of pain. It's like your energy just goes all the way down. And it's not because it's not great people that live there. It's not that. But we're just so used to pain. And I, I think, think that's, uh -huh. that's, uh, that is a conversation that has to be explored and expanded on. And I think that that's where people make the mistake. We, we do. We weaponize our ability to stay attached to pain and there's a fan and i'm gonna I'm because i know we've been at this for almost two hours so uh, I, i'm gonna let everybody go with, with with this one there was a movie the equalizer 2 and there's a scene in there where denzel's getting the young kid out of a uh he's taking him out of a gang it's a gang house and he said look he said you got a choice you got a chance you got talent and i don't want to hear about, i don't want to hear nothing about your environment what your mama didn't give you the white man won't give you no shot you got a chance you have to use it while you're still alive i think that what has to be done to change the culture is truly that but we don't i don't know i'm starting to look at this from from like the perspective of somebody just watching a game of musical chairs the hardest thing for me to accept for my people is that everybody doesn't want to sit down everybody's not going to have a chair but i had to but i think in context is it fair to say guys that we have to just pull those that are willing to come along and be like harriet tubman and the ones that want to stay on the plantation just let them go is that what it is shannon would you say that that's what has to happen um, I would say that yeah. I think the biggest detriment to the black community is that we act as if everybody is middle class and up. And mm -hmm. I think that in a lot of these, a lot of these spaces become very elitist. And I'm just going to be honest about the work I do in Chicago. I'm in the hood. I don't mm -hmm. want to be a psychologist in an office. I don't want to be yeah, a community yeah, activist in the office. I'm in the hood because the, when we think about so you're in the rough part of Chicago, when, when we, when we, I'm really in the, I'm in, I'm in O Block. Okay, Jeez. where King Von is at. That's my neighborhood. That's where oh, I do the work. Talk about old block, man. <laughs> the, rea the reality is, is that we get into a lot of these spaces, and I think a lot of these conversations are predicated on access to these spaces. These right. conversations are great. The people on this live are great, but a lot of the people on in these conversations and listening to these comments aren't the people that need it. The reality mm -hmm. is, is that the people that actually we need to be going into their homes and teaching them how to parent, we need to go into their homes and teach them how to eat healthy foods and not give their kids red dye 40. We need to go into their homes and talk about familial trauma and talk to the grandparents and the parents in the home about the ways that you raise your kids who are now parents. Nobody is doing that work. 
we're doing a lot of like upper middle class navigating work. We got to really, if we want the black community to succeed, we have to get with the lowest of the low of our community and understand that if we can heal the folks at the bottom of our community, that healing is going to permeate up. Because if I'm upper middle class, I have the financial ability to go pay for therapy. If I'm poor, I do not. But if I have somebody who's going to come to the hood and provide free therapy, and they look like me and they talk like me, I that is something I can grab onto that I may not have the economic ability to do in, at any point in time of my life. And I think that we keep trying to, I think we love, the reason that people like Sexy Red box shake Black people up so much is because we like to put that that part of Black society out of our mind. We try to act like they don't exist. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is there is people in St. Louis, a whole slew of them that are just like Sexy Red. And if nobody's going to go to do the work with those people, then what are we, what are we really liberating the Black community? The answer is no. So people like that, when they go and navigate different spaces, guess what they're going to do? Marry another Black person. And guess what that's going to then do? Create another Black child. And if we don't get into those spaces, then what we're going to do is we're going to continue to have brokenness and brokenness and brokenness from New York to California to Texas and everywhere in between. So I really feel like the conversation is when we get out of this conversation, what is us doing Black healing in action? Does it just look like I'm going with my other people who got a PhD? Or does it look like I'm going to every Black person regardless of their socioeconomic status and doing the work to get them to then self-actualize that healing is something that is free to them, something that they need, something that they deserve, because that is what white supremacy did to us. It made us think that we have to be locked into pain because we are black. We have mm -hmm. to let black people know that the healing is your birthright. It is something your ancestors may have not gotten right, but you have the access and the opportunity to do so and somebody with a PhD is coming to help you understand that and giving you the knowledge to do that. And that is something that we do not do as a black community. Which white people will go to the poorest of white people and bring them on up? We well, don't want to be out of poor black people in the hood. We want to distance ourselves because we went and got a fancy degree and did all of these things. Okay. That's well, see, that's exactly my point. And I want to turn I want to throw this to my, my, my good friend, Tony Maceo, who's just joined us. We have Tony, you and I've had these conversations on Clubhouse all the time. Do you think that it is possible that the more black people start seeing others elevate, the more we start seeing more people get married? Let's just say hypothetically our theory works. Right. We've come together. We've said, all right, we need to focus on going to therapy. We start doing this. Do you think that where we are, there's a chance that others will see what's being done and start trying to climb the ladder with us? Or do you think the same thing will happen to the people that try to make marriage the creme de la creme and make it commonplace do you think the same thing will happen to them that happened to dr king in night from 1961 to, through 1968 tony where he was the most hated negro in america because see black we, we don't want to talk about this black people hate heroes until they're dead dr martin luther king in 1967 was the most hated negro in america literally to the point where our federal government was wiretapping him from 1961 through 1968, they were trying to find anything they could. And in fact, they did find quite a bit on Dr. King, unfortunately. But anything, you pull the skeleton back, you pull the door back on anybody, shine the light, you'll find roaches somewhere. The problem is black people hate people trying to tell them to do better until they get killed. It wasn't until Dr. King's blood was shed in Memphis in 68 that black people was like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, shit. He was trying to help us out. He was trying to save us. He was trying to give us what we needed. Is it or Tony? Is that is that the same thing that's going to happen to people that try to fix? And the same thing happened to Malcolm X when Malcolm X exposed. Thank you to the people on TikTok commenting when Malcolm X exposed Elijah Muhammad for sleeping with twenty two and twenty three and sixteen year old girls getting them pregnant. Talking about I am the last messenger of Allah and I am he has left me to spread my seed. After me there will be no more. Are we just are we just screwed as a people, Tony? I definitely think that there is the uh, possibility of change, but I think you also have to get their attention. So let me answer your question. Uh, I think when it comes to the black community, I'm going to say a make a solution or make a statement that's not going to be very popular. I think sometimes salvation must be force fed. Not everybody's going to come along uh, voluntarily. Not everybody's going to come along uh, happily. Some people are going to be drugged kicking and screaming yes, sir. And, the, 
in the black community, I think what happens a lot of times, you know, there's an old saying, it says truth goes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Secondly, it's violently rejected. And third, it's accepted as self-evident. So then when we ask about, when you ask the question you ask, I think initially there will be pushback. Everyone up here has talked about, you know, how do you get through? And we talked about structures. Well, the first structure uh, that teaches anybody anything about a code, that teaches anything about unity is the family. Uh, I I'm sure you are familiar with the experience. You could say whatever you want to about your brother and sister, but no one else better not do it. Well, that's called unity. That's called togetherness. And that's something that's taught within the family structure, however that looks. The only problem is, is that that has not be, been a popular thing in the black community. Family uh, through when you look at the guise of marriage and everyone knows uh, that we're no, no one is saying two parent homes is the panacea for everything. We're just saying it's a lot better than what we have now. So, yes, there will be some people that will violently push back on that. There are some people that are going to ridicule it. And then after a while, some people will come around and then it will be accepted. Uh, the good doctor, the community psychologist talked about uh, going into the community and talking to these people. I would only add to that doctor, you got to, uh, if you're going to administer the medicine, you got to strap down the patient so he will accept uh, the antidote, so that he will accept the medication because the black community as it exists presently uh, is not too, they're not going to accept the antidote volunteer voluntarily, be it because there is a stigma around mental health, be it there's a stigma around poverty, whatever the case may be. Come on. They, they are not willing to readily accept the antidote. Come on. So you have to establish order first. And to some people, order looks like classism. To some people, order looks like elitism, but it isn't. What it is, is a form of discipline. You have to reinstate or reinstitute discipline before people will listen to anything. Doc, you're in Chicago. I'm sure you've had uh, experience, you've had observations with noticing uh, the, the FOI. Are you familiar with the FOI, Dr. James? Yes. Okay. Now, you know it's a difference between the way street people deal with the FOI and the way they deal with a normal black person, regardless of what you may think of Nation of Islam uh, theology or eschatology, you know that those men in those suits mean business. And when they come on the premises, they're going to institute order. And so that's what that's what I'm saying. Before we can look at this whole situation, there has to be order and discipline in the black community. There has to be the reinstatement of rules and regulations. Now, I heard somebody say something earlier about uh, the, the, the white uh, idea. This is the white ideals, the white ideals. Well, no one has dictated to me what exactly is the black ideals. What is the black ideals of code? What is the code? How, how do you get Negroes to stay still long enough to administer the medication of mental health? How do you get them to sit still long enough to institute the medication of unity and self-love and discipline and self-respect? Uh, wh wh where are those rules? And why aren't the, why don't we know those rules A and why aren't those rules applied to uh, us B in order to change this situation? And again, this is not going to come peacefully. This is going to be have to be force fed, and some people are going to have a problem with it. But it has to. We have to reach a point to where we say, "Oh well, it is what it is." Uh, again. And that just we just have to be resolute about that fact. So, Dr. Julio, uh, they're going to they're going to rebel against it. Some people are going to get killed trying to enforce it. Some people are going to be ridiculed. Some people are going to be persecuted. Some people are going to be lied on. They're going to be doxxed. They're going to be exposed. All of that stuff has to happen before they say, well, you know what? That does make sense. That's unfortunately, that's the state of our community. So, yes, some people there will be casualties in this war. I guess that's it. Shannon, you got something to add to that one? No, I think those are um, some some very valid points. And I will say as someone who has always worked um, worked in lower income schools, Title I schools, I've had a lot of, of contact and a lot of dealings with, um, with people who are of lo lower socioeconomic um, levels. And what I will say is that even though we look alike, 
a lot of times there's that trust factor is there. And, um, you know, you try to work with the kids and you try to work with the parents, but sometimes they're not always receptive because I've had people actually tell me, I've had a student actually tell me when I'm talking to him about, you know, what do you want to do after you graduate? And are you want, you want to go to school? You want to go get a trade? What do you want to do? You know, we're, we're trying to make a plan here. And I've actually heard kids say, uh, well, you don't understand. You don't understand my life. You don't know where I come from. You, right. you don't get it. You don't you know, know what, what my family through. structure is yeah. like. You just don't get it. So sometimes even when you try, even when y'all ha you have the similarity of skin color in common, there's so many other factors that separate you. It's it's not easy. There's no easy solution. I want to say something, Shan. I, I, I want to say something to everybody and, and get y'all's thoughts I, on this. I would like to ask a question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Tony. Please talk to me. Isn't that a form of uh, classism, though? The, the, the good doctor just said, even when you try to reach out to them, yeah, you know, because I know how we are, man. I know how we are when we reach out. Uh, a lot of the, unfortunately, in our community, there are a lot of single mothers, and a lot of times they resent the intrusion of you overstepping or quote unquote, as the black idiom go, dipping in their business. You see? <laughs> so yeah. they they yeah. they don't want you intruding too far into what's going on in their home, even though you're trying to help. And as, now, as, now, as the doctor would say. I, they would say, well, you just don't know my life. You just don't. that is a form that's usually spoken by people in the lower socioeconomic ladder. Yes, they yes. are uncomfortable with people in the so-called upper level, the upper social income uh, 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 sectors uh, reaching for uh, just to extend a hand backwards just to help them. They are the most suspicious of the people who want to contribute. I would say I, that I, I have observed I, that. I think that. I think that we have to understand the way that we are reaching back. And I think one of the one of the things that I learned that I think has changed my life is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We do as someone who has the ability to to move through class. Sometimes I forget that what I think is the things that I need is not the needs of somebody who has no economic ability. When I go into my community they know I got a PhD. Everybody saw me taking my graduation pictures outside in the hood. But the thing is, is I'm not going back under the assumption that I know what's best for somebody. And I think that's what we struggle when we call ourselves reaching back. We're reaching back and I'm going into your house and I'm telling you what's best for your kids. I'm telling you what's best for you. I'm telling you what's best for your mom and them. That is not reaching back. That is still white supremacy cloaked in blackface. But, but, but what no, reaching no. back means reaching back means that Absolutely. I'm going into your home and I'm walking with you as a partner. I'm asking you if you what if you could heal your life, what do you want it to look like? What do you want it to feel like? Absolutely. And as the person with access, but I am this helping is, you. This is where. But but here's the point, though, Doctor James. Where I would you have to get to the level to where you can get there. All of that is wonderful what you're saying. What I'm saying is you have to get through the door. Right, That's and the way that point. you get through the door is Maslow's hierarchy mm -hmm. of needs. Don't come talk to me about therapy if my kids are starving. Come with a bag of groceries and now I'm willing to talk. Absolutely. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. But I don't understand that because I'm it's middle fun. class and I don't know what it's like to miss a meal. So I'm coming just trying to talk and you and your kids ain't eight in a week. I need to put myself in the shoes of the people that I'm coming to reach back and get. And if they are poor, then I need to be able to meet their dire needs in that day. If, if this lady kids don't have no diapers, she's more willing mm -hmm. to sit down with me and have a conversation about how to become a better mom if I show up with a box of diapers and a little bit of formula. That's right. We don't that's understand that right. because that's not our class experience. We show up as middle class people doing middle class things with poor people. And that's but, the reason but, that no, poor people don't. I got, but see, I, this is where I would offer an ounce of pushback myself because you have to come doing both. You have to come doing both. And this is what I mean by that. I'm going to give you the fish, but I also need you to, if you're poor, right? You, they say, give a man a fish, each for a day, teach a fish, each for a lifetime. I'm going to give you the fish, but I'm also need you to sit the hell down and listen to what the hell I got to say. Because the poor mentality that we currently possess as a society will say, oh, well, he didn't fed me. So what else he talking about? Indeed. But I don't think that's, when you work, well, when you well, work well. with people who are poor, nobody says that. But what, no, no, what, no. What, what percentage? When you, when you sit down with poor people, 
when you sit down with when you really are doing work with poor people no poor person is saying you just gave me a bag of groceries and you took i know that you care for me and my family now fuck what you're saying nobody says that that is an elitist yeah, mindset right. about poor people that is okay. us being upper middle class and middle class and light skinned and privileged and degree and on podcast talking okay. down on people that we will never ever go and have a real conversation with every poor person that i've worked with has never said shut the hell up thank you for the groceries get out my house they're like now that i know that you care that me and my kids are no longer struggling for this day this week whatever what are you trying to tell me what i'm gonna at least listen they at least respect you enough to listen does that mean that they're gonna change no but remember your brain changes by what you see and what you hear if i can get you to listen it's going to stick somewhere in there and you may not interact with it this year or next year, but you're going to be like, remember that lady that came with them groceries and she was telling us about being better parents and maybe we don't need to beat our kids today. Cry. That's going to be in your brain now. Okay. We have, we have a preconceived notion about people who live in poverty, especially black people who live in poverty. Cause we don't talk about white people who live in poverty in the ways we talk about black. Absolutely. People and the problem Absolutely. is is that we have elitist mindsets and elitist conversations about people who really are waiting for somebody who looks like them not these white folks from the american red cross not these white people from planned parenthood they're looking for black people who have the knowledge to actually come and talk to them but we never do because the mindset is that they're going to take our diapers and say get the hell out and nobody does that no but that's the thing no if you're more, telling but but dr james if you're telling us that what are you telling us to say to them? Just what are you telling us to say? Hey, how what are you? Saying, you're saying, okay, oh, how's, your day, how's your day going? Hey, how's your day going? I noticed that you live in this neighborhood. I'm talking to Dr. James. I gave you some food. And you're asking me to help you. You asked me a question. You're asking me to give you advice or give you information about something. And I say, the way that you're going about doing it, let me get specific. Let me get down in the mud. It, black women are saying we want to date white men. And if I'm telling you <laughs> that to move in certain social circles, you can't wear certain things and you get mad at me <laughs> because I'm telling you that won't work in their world. Right. That's elitist. <laughs> I mean, you're, yes, I'm, I'm come telling you about a world let, that let, I know of. But it can come across that way. It can come. Well, hold on. Let, well, hold on. Let me, wait, you you let, can't want to be a let, part let, of a world let, that you let, hold on. Let me throw this out there. Let me throw this out there. <laughs> like, let, me, let me let me throw this out there. That's not for you. Dating white men ain't for you. If you're gonna fight everything about that, you're you're asking to be a part of his world. Yeah. And you don't want to learn about it. Yeah. You. It, well, Hello. This, this now, I'm just using that as here. one example. Just one. What it takes thirty. I, I really it do. takes thirty days. It takes thirty days for an adult who is mentally healthy to change a habit. We are asking people who are born into generations of generational intergenerational trauma for us to have one conversation or two conversations or three conversations with them and change their whole life. It oh, is now, not you know realistic. That's okay. It's let me, not let me, realistic. Well, let me let me throw this out there. Let me say this because this is the thing. I, when I when I hear that conversation about the whole generational trauma thing, I have to admit I shiver every time I hear it because I, the way I see that is, and maybe this is me coming up in a in a in a more uh, privileged, if you would, mindset. Maybe I feel like personally speaking, that trauma response is a bunch is a crock of shit, and I'm gonna tell you why. How in the hell does the trauma from 200 years ago affect me today unless I allow it? You see what I'm talking about? Because I know what I mean by that in English is this. This is what I mean. No, no black no. person that is alive today. Dr. Albert, you're going to listen here. You know what I'm about hell to say. No, you, you, hell you know, no. Ain't not I'm one of tell us. You, ain't no cotton church. Mm -hmm. We ain't not one of us. So what the hell we talking about this generational trauma shit for? Because at the end of the day, they don't mean anything. Uh, uh, and if we have generational trauma, then why are we talking about dating outside of our race? That's what I'm saying. Uh, if well, if we had if we had have some and, and racism, thing, Asian, why are we talking really, about dating outside of our race? This. If it's really if, if it's really generational trauma, if it's really generational trauma, god damn it, we would stick together. Damn it, we would actually be closer. You are not gonna convince me that the majority of the black race is suffering from trauma and we actually give a f 
because if we did, we wouldn't be so anti-black people. Our own greatest enemies look just like us. I get better treatment. I get better. I get I, when I'm going to speak someplace, I'm going to just be real. If nobody, if nobody says this, I'm going to say it. I get better treatment when it comes time to go speak when the white man is paying. I get treated better in public when the white man is around. I don't Amen. understand why. You can argue this. We can argue this all day long. But if we're going to talk about Dr. Albert, if we're going to talk about this trauma thing, let's really go. That's the meanest people to black man. people. Let's what are y'all talking here. about? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what we're talking about. And I'm like, I'm on, I'm, I'm ready to do flips. With Dr. James, I'm in Chicago too, and I'm on the south and the west side. Come on now, okay? talk to me. And I grew up affiliated on the street. Let me explain something to you. They deserve respect. That that's uh, more than anything. They deserve dignity and respect as human beings. That right? Poverty is the main is a big issue in America. Let's not let's not isolate it to color, okay? And for some reason, we are pre predisposed to believe that if we shift to the white side, it's somewhat better, and it's not. White folks are struggling too. Let's say, let's understand poverty is an evil thing that kills everybody. So when you're talking to an impoverished person that is enslaved to a system that they have no equity in, you have to uh -huh. give empathy to that. You have to speak to that first. And okay. it's, it's unfortunate because black professionals in the field of psychology, we are not understood because psychology is not a logical thing. It's not, oh, well, if you do this, then you could do that. All you got to do is A, B, C, one, two, three. No, no. Psycho social issues and mental health is a highly technical thing. It's a, why do you think we go to school? Why do you think we had to go to school to understand how the human mind works? Your environment affects you. Even when you're functionally functional in this system, doesn't mean that your mental health is adequate to your perception. That don't mean that. I so feel that a lot of frequency emotions. So if I go into the hood, quote unquote, air quote, and I say, sit your ass down. Now you're going to sit down and what you're going to do is get this. What they're going to tell you is have a nice day. That's what they're going to tell you. Oh, so, okay. Let me ask you this. From, from the psychological perspective, how much attention is paid to nurture versus nature? At what? And what I mean by that is this specifically. At what point do you understand that your environment is toxic? And at what point do you as an individual, as the individual, take responsibility for where you sit? That's what I'm asking. Because if we can't no, get a no, grasp on that, we got a problem, do we not? If I'm born, if I'm born poor, okay, because I think uh -huh. accountability and responsibility is so important right. to me. And it's always, like I said, it's spoken from certain people in certain places. Right. If I'm born, if I'm born poor, uh -huh. And you come and tell me that I need to do better and I should be better and I should go get a job, pull myself up by my bootstraps. Everybody in my family has less than an eighth grade education level and I do as well. What does do better look like? What am I supposed to do? Are you going to help me? Because these are the questions. Are you going to help me? Are you going to help me go back to high school and get my degree? Are you going to help me work on my resume? Are you going to help me get an outfit for my interview? Are you going to drive me to my interview? Because I may not have a car. And if it's the winter and it's the blizzard and the bus is not working, I'm going to miss my interview. Are you going to teach me how to talk in my interview? Are you going to teach me how to respond to interview questions? Then <laughs> let's say that I let's say that I get the job because this is what generational trauma is. And I think we think about generational trauma of these poor ass, lazy black people just want to sit their poor ass in the house and keep being poor. And that's the problem. But but y'all need King, to read oh, y'all need to read post traumatic slave syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGore. I, it will change your it. life. I've Generational trauma is not just that I want to be poor and stupid and dumb. It's that everybody there is nobody in my vicinity because you got to understand access is who is closest to you. Let, there let is nobody. Let me, let me there is nobody in the vicinity of me that can help me move up in any way. They well, don't okay, have a card to take me raise this question. Let, let me raise they this. Don't let me know how on. to write a resume. They don't. Me, nobody me around me has please. the skills for me to grow. Right. So how right. Am I let, me, let me raise right, this. Question. Right. Let me say this: Is ignorance of the law an excuse? No. If it ignorance did, did, in did, what did, way? Ignorance in what way? Hold on. Let me get this out now. Let me get this out. Did that, did the poor conditions they grew up in, did it stop Roland Hayes? Did it stop Marin Anderson? Did it stop George Washington Carver? Hell, did it stop Ben Carson? Did it stop so Harry Taylor? Using, so stop we're Susanna? using monolithic Hold on, let me go, hold on, hold on. What I'm getting at is this. Let me, let me, let me, let me go on here. Let me go on This is what I'm getting at. This is what I'm getting at. 
the poor conditions that we were raised in, the poor conditions that we grew up in stopped a lot of us, but it didn't stop all of us. So I'm trying to figure out what the hell is the difference between a Sojourner Truth and an Austin Broad? What's the difference between a Marian Anderson and a Jasmine James? What's the difference between a the Shannon Moore and a Mo- is, There is no again, girl. Like what I, I'm getting at like is. Like I said earlier, when it comes to, when it comes to co- character development. What? Oh, no, no, no. There are some people. There are people who are born and regardless of their circumstance. There what is I'm something that is down inside more. of them that makes them want to do better. That but is the exception. At, but see, that's, not what see, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. What I'm it's getting an exception, at is, not a rule. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is this. Why is everybody not seeking to be the exception? This is going back to the title of the, of, of, of the conversation. Our psychology is modeled after mediocrity, and we have adopted that by proxy. And then we sit up here and wonder why our net worth is going to hit zero by 2050. But because we have allowed ourselves to consume the lowest caliber of media, the lowest caliber of entertainment, and, and by proxy, we have allowed our mentality to now adopt the lowest standards. We have adopted the lowest bars. The bar for black achievement is in hell, and that is okay for the majority of us. And this affects so both men and women. You, and men, you live in Atlanta, we, right? You live uh-huh, in Atlanta. That's, that's right. Okay. So, so you with your nice suit and your turtleneck on, looking very Rico <laughs> Suave. How many times do you, as a black man who has these great thoughts and ideas, right? Uh-huh. How many times do you go to impoverished communities and speak to young black men uh, and show them? Not only who the they can was, be, but how to get there. How many times did time you do was, it? So from the time I was 12. In a I, year. I, in a year. No, no, no. no. In but a I'm going to tell, tell you. I'm going to tell you. From the time I was 12 years old, I, I, I went to Shambly Methodist, from Shambly First United Methodist Church. I, I From the time I was 12 years old to now, I will speak at halfway houses every year. I will go to those, I will go to those halfway houses where those brothers have been locked up, where those brothers are trying to change their lives, and I deal with them. I deal with the people that want to change. I my message is for everybody. As we can see, I'll make content that'll go viral and get a hundred thousand views or four hundred thousand views. But the overwhelming majority, the unfortunate truth is, if you look at, for example, if you take my following on on social media, it's eighty eight percent female. Of the twelve percent of men that are following my channel that look at my channel, half of them can't stand my guts. They are crucifying me. They call you a simp or this, then the third. Going back to what I said earlier, as a black person, if you're really a hero, expect to be hated until you're dead. Expect to be hated until you're because black people don't catch on to things initially. Black people, if you're not accepted by the poor and the lowest class, Charleston White said this in his interview with, with Cam Newton. In, in black culture, if you are not accepted by the hood, by the hood, you ain't a real. I'm going to say that again. If you are not accepted in the black culture by the hood, you ain't a real. That is the well, un- I'll never be a real one because I'm never accepted. No, and I'm tired of trying. See, here's, I ain't even trying no more. Forget no. it. The problem is, and Shannon, I see over there laughing because you know I'm telling the damn truth. The problem is, this is what we've done in our culture. They don't respect y'all because y'all PhDs in mass in the Negro community. You know why? Because the majority of us operate with an impoverished mindset and an impoverished setting. And we don't want to change because that makes us real. We want to identify with struggle. And that is exactly what the white man wanted. They never wanted us to identify with power. They wanted us to identify with complacency. This is exactly why Dr. King said in 63, the Negro is languishing on a corner of individual poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. As long as we look like we got it, as long as we can put on true religion jeans, it don't matter if our bank account is, is in the red. We don't matter if that bank account is, fi- is overdrawn $499 knowing damn well the max is 500 It don't make no difference because as long oh, as we look man. like we got it, that's enough. As long can as we I, can like I we jump in there? Can go I ahead, Chris. What you got? Oh, okay. man. I'm about to jump out my seat. Come on now. Oh, you tell me I'm lying. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I do want to say that I think reaching back is necessary. But I think that's only one piece of the puzzle um, in terms of outliers. Like if 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 Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, uh, you know, all of these great um, minds and icons that we hold up so to such high esteem were outliers because there wasn't there's there were so few and far between. And so it doesn't seem to be attainable. Why is it when you go to the hood, everybody wants to be a basketball player? What are the odds of that, that they're going to, why does it everybody wants to be a football player? Why does everybody want to be a rapper? What I'm, and, and I'm bringing up to this point for, for a reason, because 
we as a community, we as a whole, what we consume and what what we see on, on a larger scale is that is the, the, the path to success. That is what's celebrated in our community. Um, in poor communities, that's what they can reach to. They're like, even though the odds are dismal that those those things will ever happen, they still strive. So what can I what can I derive from that? Maybe the messages need to be different. I am one of those people that believes in black excellence. And I believe that black excellence should be put forward more. I don't believe that, um, I think that the whole big tent, we're all in, you know, we're all the same. We are not all the same. And I think that those who, who have achieved a certain higher status, they need to be put out front more, not just the, the ballers and the rappers and et cetera, but the people who have achieved a level of greatness. Unfortunately, in our community, those things are not celebrated. You know, I, I, if I were to go into the hood right now and try to speak to people, they would be like, get out of here, white girl. They will not, they would never accept me, ever. I'm too, I, I'm too whitewashed. I'm too this. So I'm going to stay over here. Like I'm over here with, with Nicole and Tony. And oh. I know it sounds really, hold on a second. Let me just finish. I know how bad this yeah. sounds. Who's right though. I know how, I know how bad this sounds, but listen, Come in on. every community, in every community, every other Come community, on. they celebrate the greatest amongst them, not just like in sports and everything else. They exactly. celebrate those who have achieved the highest. We don't. We don't. We see those things as, quote unquote, acting white or doing white or, or selling out or being a coon or whatever. Like if you have elevated ideas and you want to bring those elevated ideas, it's almost like you have to lower down, like instead of rising up and, 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 and kind of forcing people to rise up because that's all you have. Listen, back in the day, back in the day before segregation, you had black elites and you had poor people together. What happened? Poor people could experience through osmosis the success of the higher up black people. They could see it. They could see they, these examples and that they, they strove to it. It was celebrated. Um, I'm old enough to remember when excellence was celebrated in this community. And what I have found is that instead of, it's like, if, you know, I'm not a teacher, but grading on a curve is what we're doing. Instead of saying, no, you have to rise to this, you have to meet. Oh, it's been graded on a damn curve. And like meet them down here, and I'm not saying that meeting them down there is 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 um is is not an option. I do think that that should be part of the toolkit. But what I'm also saying is that there's there seems to be this guilt sometimes when we reach higher levels of success as Black people that we have to kind of you know, well, you know, I'm still black and yes, it's, you know, racist. like instead of just saying, yes, I'm owning the success. Yes, I'm doing it. And here's how I did it here. You can do it too. And let that be the bar. Let that be the bar and have people strive to meet it. I'm not saying that that's the total way of doing it, but it's not even an option. Like we, we almost apologize when we get a level of success. Why should we have to apologize for, for achieving that level of success? Why do we have to be called names because we've, we, we've reached this level as opposed to um, showing the example and then saying, get get up here, get rise to that because that's how it used to be. It literally used to be that, it be that way. When we were all together, you rose to it. You, we didn't, nobody was going down to the level. It's easy to pull somebody down. It's harder to build up, but it's still possible. And so I, all I'm asking and is proposing this, why is black excellence something that should be ashamed of and downplayed? Dr. I mean, Albert, you, you like shaking his head. Dr. Because Albert, you itching over there. It's so, itching so over automatic there. to apologize for success. Let like, him, let, let it, so let, let him, Crystal, let him answer. I want, I want to hear what he got to say. And then I, it's about to be, it's, it's getting late. I don't want to keep you guys up for too long. Dr. Albert, what do you got? Uh, you, you, you know, I can understand where Pink is coming from. Let, let, let me explain this here. Martin Luther King, the Harriet Tubman, all the superstars of black folks did it on the backs of the people that nobody knows about. When Martin Luther King was parked marching, you know where he went? To poverty, to impoverished black folks. Yeah. And they springboarded his platform, but nobody understood that. See, Martin Luther King had to relate to poor folks because he was poor. 
He wasn't this elitist. He wasn't this accomplished man. He was a young adult, 28 years old in his prime. 28? You tell me what you knew at 28. 28 years old and had an opportunity, if he would have stayed alive, probably would have been the first black president of this country. So we tend to take poverty and we want to push it in the closet because it's the ugly side of who we are. But guess what? It's the real side. It's who we are. It's the foundation of what motivated each and every one of us to be successful is where we lost. So we show by action. We show by saying, I'm going to get down there in the dirt with you. That's a leader. Leaders serve. Those that are leading, their first model is to serve. And because the complexity of who we are psychologically, we don't comprehend that. We think it's just black and white. Oh, they're, they're, they're judging me because I'm wealthy. No, it sounds like you're projected out of inferiority. That's what it sounds like. That you are trying to compensate your isolation of people because you're successful. So you want to use the excuse of saying, no, these poor folk picking on me. No, these poor folk don't understand me. But you know it what? I, 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 I will, I will say I will and say. I think we started this conversation saying that black people are not a monolith. There are 41.6 million black people in America. Mm-hmm. We keep talking about poor black people as if we know all of them based on our individual experience. I was a smart black girl and I got picked on, but I don't go out here and say as a smart black girl and everyone made fun of me. That that's my individual experience. And I can speak on my experience in Chicago. That's nobody's experience in Atlanta or New Orleans. So I think if we're talking about black people not being monolithic, we need to be very intentional when we're talking about impoverished black people being monolithic. Because like you said, Martin Luther King was organizing garbage men, the lowest of the lowest of the impoverished of the impoverished to help him do what he needed to do. And when we started getting into classism, that's when he got assassinated. So I think it's very important that if we're talking about building up the black community, I've never heard anybody be like, oh, we don't want black people to be excellent. That's why poor people send their kids to selective enrollment schools and and try to get them into college because they want their kids to do better than them. But But I think having having this harmful narrative that the black community is failing because of poor black people is white supremacy. But, but no, I, no, because we got to know because we got to play. We got we got to play the same supremacy. by the same. It's no, no, no. Like, no, check this out. By the same token, when Ebony K. Williams got on camera and said she ain't dating no bus driver because she demands black excellence, she was crucified. And guess who her number one crucifier was? Black women. When 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 she got on when a black was it woman, all black women or just a few in the comments? No, it wasn't no few in the comment section. No, 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 it no, was no, all, no. It was all. It was no. all. It was all. Seven point one percent of us. No, Doctor Jazz. We ain't doing that. Come on now. We keep making blanket you know that statements, got, but that's you know the that thing. That's, but that's what we do. But that's church. what we do on, on these podcasts about marriage. Black men point they women they think at black women. Black women point they think at black men, and that's where the accountability piece falls behind. Everybody, if if we as individual people started being accountable for what we do in our own individual sphere. Uh-huh. Then guess what? If I'm doing my job and you doing your job in Atlanta and somebody else doing their job in Detroit and everybody is doing what they're, they're, they're supposed to do to better their own individual sphere of influence, guess what would happen to the black community? We would grow and change. We spend too much time as poor versus rich person, black person, light skin, black person versus dark skin, black person, man versus woman, educated versus not educated. Our, our liberation is going to be in community. In the building up of everybody from the bottom to the top, we don't do enough of that. We spend we spend half of this podcast that dogging poor black people. No, we because we don't but, understand they like to agree with the voices they well, like, come on we now. spend it, we spend I also it. I also believe that there's a word here that hasn't been mentioned, and I'm gonna mention and I know some people are gonna squeal when I mention it, and it's called pathology. Poverty and oppression breeds a degree of pathology in people. Dr. Huey P. Newton, who is as far from an elitist as anybody I could think of, said that the Black community suffers from the twin evils of ignorance and inertia. Ignorance and inertia. And these evils, it's it's my position, and it was his position as well, these evils must be overcome. These evils must be addressed and they must be dealt with. Now, if we, we, we can talk about class to a certain extent, but 
class is going to be prevalent in no matter what uh, angle you choose to help black people. If you look at any historical society where there has been an oppressed people, the people that have pushed society forward, yes, there have been the masses, but Che Guevara was a doctor. Fidel Castro was an attorney. Uh, 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 if we go over into the Congo or if we go into Vietnam, these people are educated people. Your revolutionaries are educated people and they go back and, and, and they deal with the oppressed masses, but they know that they must overcome that initial barrier of pathology. And I think that's what people are talking about here. We're saying it in different ways, but everyone is talking about dealing with and, and having to wrestle with the pathology of poor and oppressed people. Amen. And that's that's not a that's not an easy task. That's very difficult to do. Now, Dr. James said something earlier. She said Maslow's hierarchy of needs, addressing needs as one who had who deals with children regularly, as one who deals with poor children regularly. Yes, Dr. James, you are absolutely correct. You do have to address their needs, but it's not just addressing their needs. You must also deal with the pathology of their parents. And that is an ever pervasive reality in the black community, as it is in the white community, as it is in any poor and impoverished community. I have to agree with that. And I want to I, I want to push pause in this. I have to actually head out of here. I got to go to work in a second. I want to push pause in this and, and want to say, first of all, our engagement on my engagement on TikTok has never been higher in one of my lives. We've had over 953 people that have tuned in on TikTok by itself. So I have I'm getting I have five messages sitting in here now asking for a part two to this conversation with all of these same panelists. They want everybody to come back. So is this something that y'all want to continue to do? Is that, is Absolutely. That a uh, yes. Well, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. Um, because so this is what I'm going to do for people. What I'm going to say is this. Speaking of of uh, Huey Newton, there was a Tony Huey Newton was the one. He passed away at the age of 21. He was killed at the age of 21. Am I, am I correct? No, sir. He was killed at the age of 47. Oh. Oddly, oddly in a crack deal in Oakland. <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking oddly about Huey Newton. I'm thinking about Fred Hampton. That's why I'm yeah, thinking. Fred Hampton. That was uh, Chicago. Chicago, yeah. December. Fourth, nineteen sixty nine. I think yeah. that's this people. We have to change the psychology of our people. Mm -hmm. We have to change the psychology of our people, and once we do that, then we'll move from the uh, dark alpine November to the glittering sunlight of July. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King. So, what I would say to everybody that has listened to this podcast, thank you for joining in. Thank you to Dr. Albert, Dr. Shannon, Pink Pill, Nicole, Dr. James. And of course, my good friend, Tony Maceo, who I think is a better speaker than myself. This was a hell of a panel. Uh, so go from this place, people, with the love of God in your hearts, with the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the living God incarnate in human flesh. If you put him first, he'll put you above all the rest. If you practice goodwill amongst all men, do that and do it well. And I promise you, you're going to win. People tune in at some point in the future. I will release the date of our next podcast shortly. Uh, but with that one, people, we are gone. <laughs>